Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another episode of the Muslim Money Guys podcast. We're here today in Istanbul for an inspiring episode with Mutabil. Some of you may know him as the ex rapper Napoleon, member of The Outlaws, a group founded by Tupac and that is credited with over 40 million record sales. We explore his childhood, the steps it took to becoming a record selling artist, and how, despite him being so successful by all definitions, he actually felt something was missing from his life. We talk about his journey to becoming a Muslim and moving to Saudi Arabia from the US, the sacrifices he made along the way, and his new life as a businessman and entrepreneur. This is a really inspiring story touching on the feelings of contentment and sacrifice. We hope you enjoy. The first time I got pulled over by the police in Saudi Arabia it blew my mind. Oh, I like that, huh? Yeah. Why they owe me this? <laughs> you know what I mean? They complain about the driving or maybe the system is a little slow for certain things. But to me, I'm like, man, this is nothing compared to where I'm coming from. Bro, you don't have Instagram? I said, yeah, but it's private. He said, but how are you going to be a businessman? How are you going to reach out to the people? And, and Tupac shot both of them in self-defense and he beat the, and they was two police officers. And even in the court, when they went to the court, they asked the guy, was you planning to kill the kids? He said, yes, but we ran out of bullets shooting the mother. Um, I went there with my gun and 30 friends because I didn't trust Muslims, you know what I mean? But, so I said to myself, I need to do something none of these dudes can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. We'll go with you. We'll yeah, go yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just came for grandma's cooking. Muta, brother, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How's everything, brothers? Alhamdulillah. 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 It's lovely to have you here. You've flown out all the way from Riyadh to Alhamdulillah. Istanbul. Four hours. Four hours. So, it's, you know, as an American, that's nothing. That's yeah. nothing. <laughs> Same time zone. Same, Same time, time zone. zone. No yeah. jet lag. No jet lag. Alhamdulillah. 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 <laughs> now, you've uh, been in uh, Riyadh for now how long? I've been in Riyadh now for about uh, approximately 12 years. Um, time flies because it, it seemed like it felt like I just moved there yesterday, to be honest. You know what I mean? But 12 years. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. And what, what is life like for you now that you're in Southeast? No, quite a contrast, obviously. Well, you know, Saudi um, life is very peaceful. You know what I mean? The environment is um, it's an Islamic environment, you know, so to be able to raise my kids in that environment, to live in an environment like that is it's amazing. Um, most people, of course, you know, I go back to um, America often and they still believe Saudi Arabia, because of the media and, and the negativity portrayed against Saudi Arabia, a lot of people don't have a clue how life is over there. You know what I mean? I try my best to use my social media, um, different platforms to show them the truth, but I love it, bro. It's amazing. Peaceful. You know what I mean? And uh, what does living in a Muslim country, um, how does it compare to anywhere else, like somewhere like the US? I think, um, just to be clear, because a lot of us, a lot of people, believe maybe especially converts a lot of times we believe that moving to a muslim country our life going to just cha change drastically and it's going to become perfect you know there's no perfect society you know other than jinnah we're not in jinnah yet you know what i mean so the only place that would be perfect will be paradise but in in muslim countries you're still going to face some difficulties you're still going to have certain issues but the overall um safety and the overall um the environment you know, the good outweighs the bad, you know what I mean? Because, you know, coming from America, some of the things that people would say is negative living in Saudi, to me, is light work. It's nothing, you know what I mean? They complain about the driving or maybe the system is a little slow for certain things. But to me, I'm like, man, this is nothing compared to where I'm coming from, you know what I mean? These are things that you can deal with. So safety is very important. You know, when I go back to the USA, unfortunately, I was in um, Los Angeles this summer, and unfortunately, it reminded me of the 90s. When I first moved to LA in the '90s, gang activities was at like a, 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 a all-time high. It seemed like America, especially Los Angeles, went backwards to that. You know what I mean? Where you got the chief of the police of LA said, "We advise you not to come to LA. We cannot protect you." So safety is very important. You know what I mean? The thing that I realized, you know, living in a place like Saudi Arabia, they might not have the biggest army or the biggest, you know, police force, but it allowed me to realize safety is from Allah. You know, because America, we got, you know, the biggest police, they they strapped down, you got armies, but they have no safety. You know what I mean? So it's amazing. Actually, just reminded me of that hadith of the Prophet where he so said so that, you know, if you have a place of Amman security, you mm. have a roof over your head and you have provision for one day, it's as if you have the whole world and what it contains. SubhanAllah. And this concept of Amman security, sometimes we can take it for granted. And I guess when we don't have it or people who don't have it, then you become very quickly aware of it. So 
You know, something that you have to take. You have to be thankful. Agreed. Safety is from a lot. When you, you when you realize, you know what I mean. These so called first world countries, even though they have everything that most people would think would be, you know, equipped to keep you safe, but then you realize it's not the actuality. And then you go to a place like Saudi, you drive past, and the cop might be chilling in the car on the phone. You know, you know, yeah. the, the first time I got pulled over by the police in Saudi Arabia it blew my mind. <laughs> okay, how was like? I, I got pulled over. The police walked up to me. He said, "Salam alaikum." Wallahi, <laughs> bro, I was shocked. Because in America, when we get pulled over, yeah. you might die. Yeah. You're like, yo, this is yeah. it. You might got to say shahada. Yeah. You put yeah. your hand on the steering wheel. You're uh, afraid. The police yeah. say, give me your license. You got to literally say, I'm reaching for my license now. Yeah. So he won't think you're reaching for a gun. It's like the mindset is, is very different. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. So it's hard to get from that mindset to And even to this TSD. safety. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This, this safety that you're talking about. Also, actually, it's that peace of mind. Yes, yes, yes. You know, yes, safety yes, is yes. physical safety. And there's mm. psychological safety. Yes, so what yes, you're yes, saying yes. there, you know, it's wait, you're at ease. Amazing, okay. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Now, okay, <laughs> alhamdulillah. So how would you describe yourself, bro? Man, it's hard to describe myself. You know what I mean? I like others to describe me, bro, because I might think good of myself. <laughs> no, no, alhamdulillah. I say he's, he's a loser. <laughs> I won't say how would your wife describe you. <laughs> the, <laughs> the best man on earth. <laughs> no, I said the best man walking. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, no, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, you know, what I can say, you know, I have shortcomings like every other person on the face of the earth. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? So when people realize, like when they see me put these posts up on social media, of course, they don't see what we go through personal life. They don't see our shortcomings. So I don't want people to think life is perfect for me. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm in the same race as everyone else, you know, struggling to please Allah, striving to please Allah. You know, but one thing I can say if, I'm, if, I'm, if I can describe myself is that um, one thing I did learn as a Muslim is that I don't panic. You know what I mean? Because Allah came through for me so many times when I thought it was over for me. So that's the one thing I can say, alhamdulillah, I learned never to panic, never give up. Allah always come through. And that's it. You know what I mean? Don't panic, I'm Islamic. Don't panic, I'm Islamic. Oh, Get a oh Get a I like that, huh? Yeah. Why owe me this? You know? <laughs> alhamdulillah. How much today are you defined by who you are now versus what you're not? If that makes sense. Mm. Good question, man. I think um, because that question can go both ways. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, now you know. I, I would say the older I get, you know what I mean. The more uh, I've been Muslim now for twenty years. Alhamdulillah. I think the older I get, the more that you learn. I learn about the religion of Islam. The more I realize I have so much to learn. One, you know what I mean. The more you learn, the more you realize you don't know nothing. So I think I got to be forty five years old to realize that I don't know nothing. Um. I I really learned, you know, from coming from a standpoint where, you know, I don't even like when people call me a celebrity. Like if I'm in Saudi Arabia and they come and say, you famous, you say, I say, I used to be a celebrity. I used to be, because now we just, you know, we don't want to be famous to the, to the rest of the world, but we're no one to Allah, like a nobody. So now I look at it from that standpoint of view, none of this other stuff matters. You know what I mean? If we, if we not good with Allah and you good with everybody on earth, then you moving backwards. You know what I mean? So I say that I, f I feel like I got a long way to go. I'm at the, I feel like I'm still like a new Muslim. Will I? I still feel like I'm a new Muslim, still yeah. learning, and still got a long way to go. You know Alhamdulillah. What I mean? <laughs> so you, I mean, you mentioned that thing because Islamic it says that you don't reach maturity really until the age of 40. I believe that, bro, because yeah, I was yeah. mature. No, I, but I think I didn't reach maturity until I was at least 45. <laughs> <laughs> and I just turned 45. Time, time zone difference. US <laughs> time zone still catching up. Yeah. So I, think kids, I think, man, we just immature, man. Yeah, so we got a long way to go. <laughs> but this is also why many of the NBA became prophets at 40, Stand they say. Sa, 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 yeah, sa, so sa. around 40, is it? Yeah, yeah I, I heard that you before, know? that you don't really, really reach full age. It's, it's a verse in the Quran, if I'm not mistaken. I believe you don't reach the f full strength until a man is 40. Okay, yeah. Like maturity, mentally, and I believe that. That's why our wives got to be patient with us. Yeah, All the yeah. mistakes we made before 40, y'all got to forgive us. We was I immature. Mean, I mean. <laughs> for sure, for sure, alhamdulillah. But, but through all of this, alhamdulillah, you're now uh, also a businessman. Can we say businessman, entrepreneur? What do you prefer? I prefer... You can say that, alhamdulillah, because yeah, I am a business. I'm involved in business, so alhamdulillah. Yeah, so what was your journey to getting into business? Um, you know... My whole entire life, to be honest, I always was involved in some type of business. Okay. You know, from um, 
when I got into the music industry, to me, that was a business. You know, the first time that I ever rapped in my neighborhood, um, when some, you know, older guys from my neighborhood, they was drug dealers. And they would come to me and say, we want you to rap. And I said, no, you got to pay me. So when I'm 14, 13 years old, they was giving me $1. But back then, it was a lot of money. 50 cents, I mean, like 50 yeah, yeah. cents and 25 cents. <laughs> That's when I realized that I'm going to make money from my words. And eventually, when I got into the music industry, I realized that, you know, we we used to get advance payment as rappers. So, for example, if we have a contract for a million dollars, the whole million dollars doesn't come into your pocket. This is a million dollar loan, basically. Okay. That you're going to have yeah. to use that money. To, back in the day, you have to use that money to pay for your studio time. If you want to shoot three videos, you got to shoot three videos. And back in the day, videos was millions of dollars. Sometimes yeah. you, you shoot a video for $100,000 to consider low budget. Now you got rappers or musicians, they just get this, these special cameras. I'm sure safe, no, right? <laughs> certain cameras that, yeah. And they yeah. can shoot a whole movie. But back then we had to have a whole team. You know what I mean? Okay. So yeah. when I got that money, I realized that this is a loan. So let me take advantage of it. So when I first got my first you know, payment, you know, I did like whatever rapper do. We buy some gold and some jewelry, you know, we floss on them. <laughs> and then after the bling, that, I, yeah, yeah got to get some bling, bro. It comes with the territory. Yeah, almost got some underneath this. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not, bro. I pay Zagat on it though. Yeah. Uh, so. good, good. <laughs> <Mashallah. laughs> so the first thing I used to do is invest that money. So the first business that I ever done, I believe it was um, soda machines. Really? Yeah, the soda machine business. I, I I had about four or five soda machines. I put like in apartment buildings. I put one in a, a doctor's office. I lost all my money, but it was an experience. You know what I mean? That I was so I always tried to hustle. So bro. these are like those vending machines. They put the money vending in machines. Yeah, I had it in the barber shop, and my, I forgot all about it until I went back home this summer. And, and my barber Doc, shout out to Doc. You know, he's like yes. a celebrity barber Marshall back in the day. <laughs> he's like, remember you had your vending machine? He said, like, man, that machine always was broken. <laughs> 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 he said, bro, we get. Put the money and we never got our soda back yeah. <laughs> so i always was into business bro you uh -huh. know <laughs> and then and like that kind of uh early on you kind of learned yes 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 and made your mistakes along the way and yes, learned yes. from them i would say to be honest and I, I always like to keep it real with this i would say out of all the because i never stopped you know what i mean if i if if this one fell i go to the next one i always was into something different whether it was i sold clothes before i got into real estate before I sold used cars before. Like, I never stopped. You know what I mean? And I would say, I always tell the people this. This is why it's very important as an entrepreneur, never give up. Because out of 100 businesses that I got involved in, I would really be honest and say 98 of them failed. Okay. Uh -huh. I like to tell the truth. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Nine, majority of them was failures. But I never gave up. You know what I mean? And I always use the example like Starbucks. You know, if you know the story of Starbucks, yes. they got turned away, I, I, what, 65 times? Mm. It was a, it was a high number. High number. Maybe, maybe more a lot of startups. That. A lot of startups. And, and maybe more than that. People didn't believe in it, but they never gave up. You know what I mean? So if you give up, then you don't know if you really had a chance or not. So I I go to the end. But you know what I mean? And, and then I say I have no choice to give up. Next business, it failed. Next one. You know what I mean? <laughs> Did you have a mentor <laughs> through this, or was it you kind of just doing it yourself, just trying it out? Huh? Did you have a mentor? Did you have someone who? I didn't kind of really advising? have a mentor. I grew up with um, you know, Park was my mentor. Okay. You know what I mean? Um. So, you know, some of the things that I learned, some of the things I learned from the hood and some of the things that I learned from the music industry, I just continue to take it with me in life. Because you you got to understand in the ghettos of America, you have a lot of brilliant brains in the, in the middle of the, the worst neighborhoods that you would think no one would come out of it. You understand? But you got to understand the Jay-Z's. And I'm not talking about his music. I'm talking about from his business. He's a smart businessman. He come from Brooklyn at a time when Brooklyn was one of the worst places in America. He came from the Marcy Projects. A dr young drug dealer, you know, living a bad life, a haram lifestyle. Yeah. But when he got into, when he got a chance to be legit, look where he at now. You know what I mean? He's a, one of the first billionaires from the hip hop community. I mean, then you got people like Dr. Dre. These are people that made their money from business, not even from the music part of it. You know yeah. what I mean? They became with the headphones and all these other things. Yeah, so, absolutely. you know, some things that we learned growing up in the hood. I always I always compare it to these Arab Bedouins from back in the day that when you was raised in the desert, you know, I had one of my friends in uh, Saudi told me his grandfather taught him how in certain plants in the desert you can pick up and there's water inside of it. And you would never know that unless yeah. you could you you track it, you walking in that desert, you living in that desert. That's the same in the hood. Like certain things we know what to stay away from. We know and that same plant in the city, he said you can't drink it from it because it's sewage water. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's just something that you learn just from, you know, from life. Experiences, yeah. <laughs> Experiences. That's actually a very deep point, uh, Brother Mutak, because 
when you look at it, the talent uh, is there, but the opportunity isn't. True. Um, when you often, when we talk about riba, I speak about riba quite a bit. And it's one of those yes. sins you can't really understand is uh, implication, mm. which we'll discuss later, inshallah. inshallah. And one of the key things, though, is that you see the way interest and riba is that it makes money for those who have money. Yes. It makes the rich richer. Mm. Whereas the Islamic principles of investing and money flowing in society yeah. is that money is distributed so it finds the talent. Mm. And so if someone has talent, this is what they bring to the table. And you who have money, you bring capital. And then you both grow. You So it's an equilibrium in terms of uplifting society as opposed to just money lending, mm. which means one party just gets richer and richer. And you can have all the talent in the world. But you'll never get the opportunity. You never get out really out of debt going through interest. You know no, what I mean? subhanallah. Subhanallah. You know, so it makes yeah. sense. It makes sense, bro. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> We've just started the podcast. You mentioned so many interesting points. Uh, the you, first bro. thing I want to touch on is you said 45, bro. Like, mashallah, yes, yes, you got very yeah. good genetics. Exactly. Okay, I gotta say, <laughs> <laughs> like me here with my grades, like some people are watching this podcast probably thinking that's nah, <laughs> older. But alhamdulillah. <laughs> but also, I, I think another interesting point you mentioned about social media, because now how you use social media and you're putting content out there, but you, it's content you choose to put out there. Yes. yes so yes, yes, yes. I think an important reminder to viewers all over is when you see people who have yes. social media profiles, is mm. what you're sharing is not the full picture and that's always important to remember. Of course, of course, you, you know, and I think um, you have to realize social media is entertainment now. You know it what is. I mean? So the same way when you look at a movie, we show what we want the, the people to know of us, you know what I mean? Um, so, which we need nowadays, you know, I, I wasn't really, um, I, I ran away from social media until my neighbor, who happened to be a Saudi, you know, Fahad, um, Alo Tabi from a big tribe and he was like bro you don't have Instagram I said yeah but it's private he said but how are you going to be a businessman how are you going to reach out to the people and I said nah nah and then when I un I made it you know available you know what I mean I made it open I was like this is actually one of the best things you got good and bad but nowadays we need social media you need it for so many it has so much care even though it has the down bad but that's life in general but we need it definitely it's a you tool, ultimately. It's, it's a tool. tool. Yeah, um, it's a tool. You can. It's up to the individual whether to use that tool for good or bad. True, true, true. And true, there true. is also so much yes. good out there. And you know, inshallah, true. with this podcast as well, where true. our aim is, our intention is to be spreading good as well. So you have to, man. I think like the podcast. It. When I first heard about it, I was very. We don't have nothing like this in the Muslim community that's teaching us about finance. You know what I mean? Nowadays with social media, you can just go to the YouTube page and you. It's free. You know what I mean? You guys ain't charging nothing. You, we can listen. We can learn now because in the Muslim community, and I believe especially like I can talk, I can talk about the African American community and the Latino community. We really financial illiterate. Not everyone, of course. You know, you has a, a lot of successful people, but I would say majority of the people, and even in Islam, we 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 have to know about in the modern days business. You know what I mean? Because our grandfathers or your grandfathers who were Muslim probably in a time they trade with just basic trade you know what i mean but now things are so complicated you know what i mean so you guys got to teach us this bro got no. the platform <laughs> inshallah that's the, that's the aim and intention inshallah, bro, inshallah. Because, look, even we found this in the uk as well it's not just those communities that yes. areas of high social deprivation like the poor mm. communities mm. in the uk there's a high correlation of financial illiteracy mm. and it's not something that's taught in yeah. schools like true, you true. know you know? teach everything except for f how to count some money. Yes. Yeah. So this point you were making that you <laughs> save got, money. Yeah. How to count how to save. Yeah. Teach you how to count. This million <laughs> million dollars that you were given, and then you had to pay for your yes. recording and your yes, studio yes. time. Is that when you get money, you think you're getting this much, and then tax True. man comes and yeah. tax is taken man out take, and, and interest. Of the, course, the, the the whole structure of the music industry is actually based on interest. Believe it or not. So really? that million dollars, you'd be surprised when you code and you say, for example. All the records myself personally that I appeared on was over 40 million record sales worldwide. It might be, you know, this is the number that I checked maybe 10 years ago. So when people hear me do a talk 10 years ago, I always say 40 million. But nowadays, Tupac records are still being streamed. They still being downloaded. Yeah. And I was on every record, you know, that he done except for his first one, I believe, you know. So the more that these records sell, my voice is still on these records. Um, they still making millions of dollars. I, I sold 40 million record sales with Tupac, the Outlaws, with my group. And in, in reality, they owe me, I would say, if I'm doing a rough estimate, they mm. at least owe me 
at least $10 million. You understand? At least $10 million. But when I became Muslim, I didn't care about it. I said, Allah, Allah saved me from that life. I don't want to go back and, you know, it's going to cost millions to get in. It was haram money anyway. Yeah. You know, because yeah. when I became Muslim, I walked away from my royalties, everything. Most rappers, we get royalty checks. So every time a record sell, we get paid. But when I realized that I'm leaving this lifestyle, I figured leave the money as well. Like, how can I talk against this lifestyle but eating from it? Yeah, so I walked so away from all of that, you know? But the, the way they get the musicians is they give you that million dollars. And then when you go back and say, okay, I just sold a million records, a million records back in the day, we used to pay in our time what $10, $15 yeah, a yeah, CD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's and when right. you go and say, well, I just sold a million records, that shows 15 million. They usually come up with these scams and then they would say, well, the first million dollars we gave you, you know, you spent this, but it cost us 5 million to print these records. And, um, this electricity bill that you was in the studio, like they just come up with so many miscellaneous yeah. things when they and they all work together. And it's nothing you can do really because a lot of us 15, 16 years old, fresh from the hood, fresh from the hood, no financial literacy at all. So we go and we believe them because they give us this invoice and then they say, well, now you owe us money. And They're most of the time, suits, yeah, yeah, like you just be, they, you know, so it's very difficult. So, you know, the interest now, nowadays is different. Rapper stream, get money, whatever. I don't even know that side, but back in the day, it was they really can just take advantage of you. You know, but firstly, may Allah Zawaja replace that money with I something mean. better in this world and the next I for mean, you. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean. alhamdulillah. Yeah, no, that we'll we'll talk a bit about that sacrifice because that's huge, and you know, we always say that whatever you sacrifice in the way of Allah, Allah, Allah blesses you with way more. And we, we, inshallah, so, you know, no. may Allah bless you for that. And we I want to talk mean, a bit more about your childhood as well. Um, yes, yes, yes. Because as, you, as you've been talking about coming from the hood, yes. um, it's a very a big challenge. And obviously you've learned a lot with experience. Yes. But um, when we look back and obviously the name, uh, many, many will know you as with the name Napoleon. Yes, yes, right? yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> w where did that come from? Can you give us a bit of background? That name came from, um, you know, Tupac. If anybody was familiar, you know, when Tupac, you know, we went through different names, you know. When I first got involved, I just wanted him to call me Moo. My yeah. rap name before was Little Moo, and I didn't want to change it. Like, okay. when he called me Napoleon, I was mad. When he put me in the Outlaws, I was mad because I wanted to be a solo artist. Okay. When he's like, I'm putting this group, I want you to be one of them. I was like, damn, man, this dude, I don't want to be rapping with these guys. <laughs> yeah. But then we just clicked and it became what it became, you know. Yeah. So, you know, Pac went through a, a period where um, he got shot, almost got killed, got robbed um, by some gangsters in New York. And, and then he went to prison. So imagine you get shot, I think um, one month later, two months later, they put you in prison for something he didn't do. It was known that he didn't do it. Everyone, you know, a, a, a lady said something happened, but the judge didn't even lock him up for that. He said, well, you was being mis uh, uh, inappropriate, something, something, and he gave him some time in prison, really to shut him up. So while he's in prison, got shot in prison a month later, 23, 23 years old, 24 years old, um, he started to read these books, um, certain books, you know what I mean? And he decided, he called us in to meet him one day. He was like, man, I'm changing everybody's names. We like, what are you talking about? He's like, I'm, I want to call you guys the outlaws and I want everybody to have name of so-called tyrants or leaders of the world. You're going to be Napoleon. Because I used to have a short man complex. I used to have a very, very okay, bad temper. Okay, okay. A very fiery temper. So Pot said, you got the short man complex. So you Napoleon Bonaparte, you Edie, I mean, you Gaddafi, you Castro. So he gave us a lot of names that was so-called enemies of America as well. And 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 he changed his name to Maca Evelly, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And, and then that's how we got the names. That's quite deep, actually, when you think about <laughs> yeah. it like that. So he was actually against the system at this point then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was always really pretty much against the system. But this, he wanted to really, he, at this time, he was against, you know, he just got shot. You know, so, and, and I remember Pat used to say to me personally, he said, man, I never would think a black person would shoot me because most of my lyrics was talking about our struggles. He said, he said, I was so blinded, I would never thought my own people would come because Pac was considered the Malcolm X of hip hop. You know what I mean? Um, he seen a lot. I don't know if a lot of people know the story. Like he was happened to drive in Atlanta and seen two white guys beating up a black dude and Tupac got out. And when they turned with a gun and Tupac shot both of them in self-defense and he beat it and it was two police officers. And he went to court, got arrested, and they let him out free because these two police officers, they stole the gun from the police station. They was intoxicated and they was bullying a black dude. So Pac was the type, when he saw that, he put his whole career on, online, his 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 safety okay. online to help that person. 
You know what I mean? So he used to say, I would never thought a black person would shoot me. But, you know, um, he got himself involved with, you know, some people that was kind of shady and it came back to him. So I guess when he started changing the names, he he was going against the system and also he was going against certain people and, you know, he, his Justice. whole mindset was changing. So it was definitely about the struggle for him. It wasn't just something that wraps up. I mean, when you look at some of the rap artists today, so I hear, yes. it seems very manufactured. Yeah, right, yeah, you know, yeah, from what I hear too. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 so too. with him, it was genuinely about the struggle, and he seems like a thinker from what we've heard. And obviously, yeah, you yeah, moved yeah, with yeah, him. Yeah. You can say yeah, that, yeah. like it was we was uh, we was trying to be we were trying to be the voice of our community. You understand? Okay. But you got to understand because when Park and him came out, he had people like um, Dolores Tucker. She was a you know um, some big. I think she's a congresswoman, and then you had the president, you no, know, the vice president. Dell or something like that they used to get on tv and say don't listen to these music don't listen and they used to say don't listen to tupac music in general you know yeah. so he always felt like he and he came from the black panther party you know coming from the black panther party where his mother what his, his stepfather them went through they was against the system in a way a lot of people when they hear the black panther party they think of it in a racist way but they don't know black panther parties had white people mm. asian people latino people you know what i mean um and they were just trying to better the community. They was when the Black Panther was around. They was policing their own community. They yeah. wasn't allowed drugs in the African American community. Um, Matulu Shakur, who's Tupac's stepfather, they just released him last week after forty years or thirty five years in prison. They just released him. Um, he used to go around. He went to China and learned acupuncture, and he used yeah. to go back to the neighborhoods for free and help alcohol like people on alcohol and. Um, alcoholics and drugs addicts get off of drugs using acupuncture. He was giving this free in the community. They used to get free breakfast. The Black Panther Party. So he came up with these people. You know what I mean? But eventually they all got arrested because the police felt you know America. They had some mistakes though. Don't get me wrong. They did a lot of mistakes that they did some things that they shouldn't do. You know they broke like they used to. They had a system where they were robbed from the bank and use that money to give to the poor, like a real Robin, Robin Hood, Hood yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But they broke the law. Yeah. So when they broke the law, they got in trouble, you know what I mean? And so he came from that environment. When his mother was eight months pregnant with him, the FBI put a shotgun to her stomach and took her to prison. If I'm not mistaken, he was born in prison, Tupac. So when he was raised, he kept hearing these things. The police was against you, the FBI is against you, the CIA, your stepfather, Matulu Shakur, he's locked up for 35 years. In reality, he, they didn't catch him with anything. They just wanted to stop these people. You know what I mean? You know, you're speaking about this, uh, subhanAllah, and I guess many people are thinking, wait, this can't be real from uh, a country that has the most successful companies in the world, right? It's kind of the, the figurehead of democracy and success and capitalism true, true, true. but actually it's built on a lot of injustice yes bro no, America, America is like a double edged sword meaning that you have so many things that can be against you but if you work hard enough and you get the right education you can get up out of there yeah you know what I mean like we got some people that's from the hood that really made it even though they might have had the odds again but America has that system so you know that's the good thing about it. Yeah, where, the opportunity where, where that the opportunity is there, but it might be a little harder for people of color and people in certain neighborhoods. You know what I mean? But you can, you can, if you can get past it, then you're good. <laughs> so it is, is a land of opportunity. Yeah, it is the land of opportunity. You know what I, I mean? Just want to say one thing interesting about the name Napoleon. Yeah. Yes. So yes, if you yes. know this or not, but Napoleon set up uh, the Bank of France. So France has wow. a central bank. Napoleon mm. actually set it up at that time, and it's a private endeavor. It was a mm. private bank, so it was not owned by France, the government, mm. and they did it to be able to fund or catch up for all of the expenses of war. Wow. Right? And actually, historically, you'll see that there's this mm. strong correlation between banking uh, mm. and particularly interest and mm. war. Wow. So funding, wars, and even to this day, you'll see yeah. when the, the economy is struggling, then an easy way out of it is yeah, let's get war. into war. Wow, so, wow, so Napoleon, wow. you know, he, uh, he was, this, huh? yeah. oh, he was back in the day. So, oh, man. Napoleon. But, well, I'm the real, I'm the American Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> I love these facts from Omar. And, you know, as yeah. they say, war is an economy. This is, it um, is. War is business, bro. Yeah. Like nowadays, you know what I mean? It, 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 it's a business. Well, one interesting thing that you mentioned there, because we're speaking about injustice, and you spoke about Tupac and how he saw those two, um, you know, police officers, and he actually acted out um, against the injustice. And Omar, you're going to be better at quoting this, but um, <laughs> you know, when when you do see injustice as a Muslim, you're supposed to. True. Um, I'm going to let you carry on. Okay, so you change it with your hand, and if you can't change it with your hand, then you speak out against it. 
And if mm. you can't speak out against it, then at least feel it in your heart. Yeah. And that's said to be the, the weakest of, of faith. Sa, sa, sa. But this is this thing when you just said about him that yeah, he actually yeah. went out physically. That's, that was his personality. And he was only 23 years old doing these type of things. So he had a lot of good with him. He had a lot of, you know, I think the last days of his life just got, you know, when he went to LA, this is a different ball game. The game banging activity in LA was different. And I and I think even though Pac had a lot of friends who was Cribs and Bloods, but I don't think he realized how deep it was. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you got people in LA that they structured now. You know yeah. what I mean? So now you're dealing with multi-millionaires, but who are connected with these gangs. It was like mafia almost. They connected, they have structure now. And I don't think Pac realized, you know, how deep it was back then. So when he fought one guy who was a crip, the guy came back and that's was how he ended his life. So his last days, it, it got bad. So even for me back in the day, you know, living amongst that stuff and living in that type of life, you don't really see how bad it is until you get out of it. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Until Allah saved me, I became Muslim. And I look back I and I'd be like, wow, I was in the middle of this. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I can look back and see what happened to my friends like Pac and Qaddafi and other members of the outlaws or other friends who, who didn't survive. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you don't, well, I don't think we fully appreciate the impact our environment yes. has on us until you're removed from that environment. Until you're removed from it. Yes, true, true. Real talk. And we, we talked about the the your stage name, Napoleon, now. Yes. Your actual name. So the full name, for those yes, who don't yes. know it. My real name? Yes. Muta Wasin Shabazz Bill. This is actually the name my parents gave me. Okay. A lot of people don't know that. They think, yeah. <laughs> they think it's... <laughs> they think, but in Arabic awesome. it's Muta. Mim ta alif ain. Yeah. So it's pronounced muta. Like Allah? to be like Allah says in the Quran, it is is mentioned in the Quran, muta amin, talking about the Prophet to, to and, and muta mean to be obeyed. You understand? So my parents converted to Islam before I was born. So people a lot of people also don't know I was actually born Muslim. My mother and father converted to Islam, but when I was three years old, my mother and father got murdered in front of me. And the people that killed my parents was from the nation of Islam. Okay. So the nation, so my grandmother didn't know the difference between Islam and the nation of Islam. You guys know the nation of Islam was just like the people who went against Malcolm X. Malcolm X had to go to Mecca and realize that they're not preaching proper Islam. They believe Allah is a black man, Audu Billah. And they believe that white people are devils. This is all white people are devils and only black people. Yeah. They have a very they have they un, they 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 don't believe in Islam properly at all. You know what I mean? So when these people killed my mother and father, my grandparents who took me and my brothers and raised us as Christians. Okay. So I remember the day my grandmother made me get on my knees and start praying every night before I go to bed. I remember these things. Yeah. And I used to be like, man, you know, as a kid, I didn't my my parents didn't teach me this. So I was born Muslim. They gave me these names, and then I was raised as a Christian. You know, so I used to grow up hating Islam because my grandmother used to tell me Muslims killed your parents. Because she didn't know the difference between the nation of Islam and Islam. So I used to say, Muslims killed my mother and father. I, I want nothing to do with Islam. I hate Muslims. Never in my life I thought that I would ever become a Muslim. Never. I, in a thousand years, I used to say I would never accept the religion of Islam. You know what I mean? So, but alhamdulillah, Allah guided me. Alhamdulillah. 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 Now with the, uh, so the, the middle names, uh, is there any background to that? Or Sin Shabazz? I think, well, Sin Shabazz, I think for people like my parents, in the 70s or the 60s, when they was accepting the religion of Islam, a lot of African-Americans, they wanted to give names to their children that was different than the names their parents had. Because like my grandmother, you know, and, and other relatives, even my father, his real name was Lorenzo. My mother's real name was Alice. My mother was Puerto Rican and Cuban. Her real name was Alicia, but we call her Alice. So my father changed his name to Salik. Okay. I mean, like Salika, straight path. Yeah. You hear that name yeah. in Turkey a lot, matter of fact. Yeah. And my mother changed her name to Aquila, like Aquila, Aquila. Aquila. Yeah. So, but Americans, they pronounce it Aquila, you know, uh, yeah, ghetto, yeah, ghetto yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So my parents, when they gave me the name Mutag, who well, I seen Shabazz, they just, whatever sound Arabic, back in the day, they just named their kids that. Like, they didn't really understand the meaning of these names, you know what I mean? I know somebody named Jahan, Jahim, stuck for life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a singer, a big singer. And yeah, then, yeah, that's and right, that's right. Yeah, right. So I know this concept because you got a lot of people in America where you might hear a guy named Jamal, a lady named Khadija, but they're not Muslims. Shakur. Shakur, like Tupac Shakur. They're not Muslim, but because they didn't want to give the names of the so-called oppressors. So uh -huh. we, you know, our parents really went through the civil rights movement where when there was a lot of racism between blacks and whites. You know what I mean? So to give your son a name like like no disrespect, but like let's what's a good American name? 
I don't know. Harry for no, that's my grandfather name, Stefan. <laughs> Harry, Harry. So this yeah. I won't be biased. It's my <laughs> yeah. Cuban grandfather. Yeah, yeah. Like for our parents, they felt like that probably was more closer to the people that oppress us. So they used to say, Well, we black. Originally we know our family come from Africa somewhere. What are West African names? You know, so a lot of times they did it thinking they're getting West African names, not knowing that West Africa, majority of the nations are Muslim. So they was getting these Arabic names, Shakur, um, Jamal, Khadija, you know what I mean? Hassan. So, Hassan. Uh, so you have these names yeah. in the hood, they don't know nothing about Islam. A lot of them not Muslim, you know what I mean? I thought maybe the Shabazz came from Malik al-Shabazz. Maybe, because my my parents, when 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 Malcolm X actually left the nation and became Muslim, my parents did the same thing. Okay, so they were part of the nation They were part of the nation first, and then when they followed Malcolm X, when he became Muslim, my parents accepted Islam. Alhamdulillah, before they passed away. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yes, Alhamdulillah. Yes. Alhamdulillah. And now, um, you know, uh, after that, I mean, as, yes. as a child, that must have been... Yes. You, 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 you witnessed it as well, I believe? Yeah, I witnessed yeah. Uh, the, the death of my parents. I got shot in the foot. Really? You know I mean, a bullet hit me in the foot. I was three years old. My brother was four. My brother has a, a stronger mind, memory than me. You know, I have. it was me. I was three years old. My brother Mooney, he was four. My brother Camille was six months old. So my mother, my father got killed instantly. One shot, he was dead. Uh, my mother, they shot her 13 times. And she was protecting me and my brothers. She put my little brother in the drawer and cracked the drawer. And she was running around the house, like, taking care of her babies. And even in the court, when they went to the court, they asked the guy, was you planning to kill the kids? He said, yes, but we ran out of bullets shooting the mother. You know, so it's like I, my mother gave her life protecting me and my brothers. Alhamdulillah. Allah give a jinnah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, so I mean that's, that's really emotional. Like, may, may Allah. Grant I, mean, I mean, I mean, um, How was you upbringing as a child after that after that tragic incident and you you mentioned your um grandmother yes yes what's your how, how was that for you afterwards? so my grandmother my my father's mother she she's the one who really raised us she was a very sweet woman very respected in the neighborhood she she was a christian woman like i would say like a real christian you know what i mean like i never even heard it say and my grandmother say like damn which is not really a cuss word the whole house like oh my god grandma's angry like she never had cuss words out of her mouth. She was very a very good woman, spiritual woman. You know what I mean. Went to church yeah. a few times a week. Um, but when I got a little older, I would say about 11, 12 years old. They old people. Then my grandmother was an older woman, so I started going to the streets. You know, so I started going to a neighborhood a around the corner called Chancellor Avenue. And I, now I'm hanging around drug dealers and murderers at 12, 13 years old. My brothers became drug dealers. My cousins became drug dealers. And I became a drug dealer. I tried to, I was 13 years old the first time I sold cocaine. You know what I mean? So imagine how easy it is. Like now I can look at my kids and be like, wow, the, when, he, when they take out the garbage, I'm nervous. Like they barely know how to take out the garbage in Saudi Arabia. I, I tell them, don't get hit by a car. You know, that's, that's, the, that's what they got to worry about. But when I was 13 years old, I was on a block selling drugs and people was getting shot and murdered. I grew up in that environment. You know what I mean? But what saved me is that one of the first times I went to sell drugs, I got um, arrested. You know, I, it, we used to sell cocaines and vows, like these okay. like perfume yeah, vows. Yeah. And I remember when the police came, I ran into the grocery, the, the Bacala, not Bacala, that's where we call the stores in Saudi. <laughs> I, <laughs> right. I ran okay, into the corner let, store. No, none yeah. of this goes on in yeah, Saudi. Not, yeah. None of this goes on in Saudi. <laughs> <laughs> I ran into the corner store and I took the drugs and I hid it in the, refri the freezer where they sell the ice cream. And I thought I took all of them in and got rid of all of them, but one of the cocaine vials was stuck in my pocket. So I went outside and the police, which is a good thing, I'll tell you why, because it changed my direction and thinking and everything. So when I went outside and they started patting everybody, and I'm thinking in my head, like, he ain't gonna find no drugs on me. I was even arrogant to the police, 30, little kid talking back. And he pulled it out the pocket. I was shocked. Like one of them slipped in my pocket. And I remember he slapped me in the head and he took me, and, you know, he was a. Um, a white police, as in, in fact, it was a white police, and he was like, you know what, you're going to ruin your life, I'm not even going to put charges on you. Because back then, if they would have put charges on me, now I'm 13 years old, I could have, he said, but I'm going to call your grandmother, this and this and that, and my grandmother came, and she, you know, I got in trouble, yeah. and then everybody in my neighborhood was like, man, you, this is like your first week outside, or first month or whatever, and you got locked up, oh, you a bad drug dealer. Yeah. So I said to myself, I need to do something none of these dudes can do. And that's when I start writing raps. Yeah. So yeah. I go back outside and I write a rap while they selling drugs. I the drug dealers yeah. was paying me, so I say, look, I outsmarted them. Yeah. They gotta sell drugs. I'm rapping, getting money from they the money they making from the drugs. They paying me to say raps. You know what I mean? So then I just took it serious, the rap career. And, and that's how you actually got into into rap. Into yeah, that's music. how I actually got into rap. Wanted to do something that the drug dealers couldn't do in my neighborhood. 
you know. Wow, strong. <laughs> wow. And it was from a poetry perspective. Yeah, poetry. I started out writing poetry, but I will always speak about what I seen in my neighborhood. You know what I mean? My first rap was called Money and Murder. 13 okay. years old, I remember the hook, like, money got me feeling like a star, but murder got me feeling like my death ain't far. And because this is my environment, you know what I mean? I'm seeing yeah. people, you know, getting shot. I remember, you know, bullets I, I used to go past my head. Like, I, like sometimes I sit back and I say, Allah saved me so many times. Like, I was in environments where bullets literally was going past my ear and like and then i turn around and the person they shooting at is shot up right here and i'm running oh, next wow. to him so you know it, it took years for me to say wow allah saved me so many times you know even in a, as a drug when and, you know the drug dealing scenario i got locked up quickly which made me change my direction in life all that. my brothers and cousins and my friends continued they all went to jail um some of them got killed most of a lot of my friends got murdered because of this so i left that when they started growing, I started going towards the music industry. You know what I mean? Really? Maybe it was the du'a of your mother for you yeah, to be sir. protected. Sir, sir. Not just in that occasion, yeah, true, true, true. but you after as well. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. You know? I'll accept sir. it from them, reunite I you in for those. Amen, amen, amen. So from, I guess you were probably a cocky little 13 year old. You know what we mean by that, yeah? Yeah, 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 we was, bro. Boisterous, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Think I'm doing something. Yeah, so, and I guess because the Napoleon, you were small as well, so you probably like, you know. You had to be, yeah, yeah, you yeah. had to be extra. When you're so, small in the hood, you got to be more gangster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, and I come from an environment really where my family was dangerous. Like my brothers and my cousins and them, they we they, we had a, a reputation. Before I got into the music and we had a reputation, don't mess with this family. So I just okay. took that over to me with the music, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lyrically, I just let them yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so from that, how did you then get into the Outlaws? As in, what was the journey from that to yes, uh, end up yes. being So Tupac? one of a childhood friend of mine by the name of Yafeyo. Okay. Okay. His mother and... My cousin was very close friends. They played basketball together. So she would pick me up when I was a young kid and take me to his neighborhood. He lived in a, a neighbor, the suburbs called Montclair, which was a, a, a more um, upscale neighborhood than the way I was grew up. So I used to love going away from my neighborhood, going over there, very quiet and peaceful. And years went past and I haven't seen her. And at this time, I'm maybe 14 years old. I run into her and um, she said, how you doing? What you been up to? I said, I'm, I'm rapping. And I was like, how was y'all feel? She like, he also rapping. By the way, his brother's by the name of Tupac Shakur. Do you know Tupac Shakur? I said, yeah, of course, because Pac at this time, he put a record out. Okay. And so she like, if you serious, they in Manhattan, won't you go meet up with them? So the next day I got on the train with my brother, went to Manhattan, uh, walked in the room. I was seeing Gaddafi, my friend Yafeo, yeah. before he became Gaddafi. And he's a whole new guy now. He's like six feet something. And I seen the rest of the outlaws, Edie and Castro was there. And I'm waiting and eventually Tupac came in. You know what I mean? So he came in, we started talking, and from there it was on. Like from that day, I just never separated from them. You okay. know, he, you know, and you he, were accepted straight away? He yeah. knew I think he asked not he he didn't put me in a group straight away, but he knew about my parents. So when he walked in the room, you know, me, I just want to play my rap music. I don't want to hear nothing else. Take my demo, listen. So I'm waiting, like, when he going to tell me to rap for him? He didn't. He said, um, what happened to your parents? And I started telling him, and, I'm, and I think my eyes was looking somewhere else. And I looked up, he was crying. And for me, this shocked me because he was already known as a so-called gangster rapper. And, but the world didn't see his sensitive side, you know what I mean? So when I seen him crying, it threw me off because that's the first time somebody reacted over the story of my death, um, the death of my parents. Because in the ghetto, you have many people who don't know their father. They don't know this. So nobody react that way, you know. So when he, he did that, it kind of threw me off. And then he was like, I'm going to take care of you. We're going to put something together. And then eventually I went to Atlanta where he was living in Atlanta. And we got into a studio. We went to the studio. And when he heard me rap with the outlaws, he wasn't there. We played it over the phone. And he was like, Wow. I got to put you in this group. This is what I was waiting to hear from y'all. We just like teamed up together. You know what I mean? And and from there, we just we just became first drama side, first the young thugs, then drama side, then the outlaws. SubhanAllah. You know what it is? I'm just listening to this. this is, um, one thing that I really kind of I'm getting from speaking to yourself um, is this sense of community. Mm -hmm. like, even when you're speaking about, you know, they're yes, speaking yes. to each other today, we live in yeah. a time where people don't even know their their neighbors. We don't true, talk to true, each other, true, right? True. But there's a real sense of the community, even true, in the ghetto. Wow. Of course. You know, the ghetto is one of the, the ghetto is very special to me, bro. Like, you know what I mean? It's always going to be special because some 
the ghettos still have value. Family ties. I mean, yeah. family tradition. You, it's something special about the ghetto. It's not only the negative side, the killing and stuff. What about the other community things that go on in the ghetto? You know what I mean? Like how many Saudis I know when they tell me they went to America, they like the only time place I really felt comfortable is when I went in the hood. They remind, like I hear Saudi saying, they remind me of us back home. Like the grandmother still cooking dinner. You know, everybody got to eat at the same time. They make the guests eat. They're like, man, we felt, I felt like I was back in Arabia. So you still have these in the hood. You know what I mean? But be careful in the hood. You still got yeah, yeah, yeah. to go. Okay, we'll go with you. We'll yeah, go yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just came for grandma's cooking. Yeah, we get the food and get out. We, we eat and leave. Yeah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. But then there's also this um, this sense of even the way Tupac and the Outlaws kind of made you. There's a sense of, I guess, community within that kind of music True. fraternity. Yes. You know, this was what, over 20, 25 years ago now, right? We're saying. About tw over 25 for sure, man. Maybe. Yeah. Probably close to 30 years. Tupac died okay. in 1996. Okay. So and who's the number guy here? Do the math. 96. He's yeah. a number guy. He's a number guy. He's yeah. a finance so, guy. Now, let's see. If 2016 he's would have been 30 years and then wow. plus another. Yeah, wow. So you're so looking over at. Over 30 years. Wow, 30, wow, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Time flies, bro. <laughs> yeah, subhanAllah. That's serious. That's yeah, serious. serious. Wow, wow. Yeah, true. Okay, so. But we was like family, definitely. Even yeah. with Tupac, I never felt like. And the way he groomed us, we ne he 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 made sure that we didn't think we were celebrities. Yeah, you know that's why even though we was on millions of records, people really didn't really see our face. He yeah. never wanted us to be caught up in. He used to call it success, yeah. music industry success. He called it success. It's sickening. He used to say it. So he yeah. used to get mad whenever we tried. To, he wanted us to rap but be in the background. Wow. He didn't want us to be because he knew it destroys you. Wow, you know what I mean? so this is 27 years exactly, if we say, you know, 27 that's years, almost yeah. 30 years, subhanAllah. He's been working that in the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, you know, when you see that yeah, meme, yeah, you know, always, right? <laughs> equations, Because <laughs> <yeah. laughs> I know that there's people out there who aren't going to forgive me for that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. quick double check on that, yeah, you know? So how do you <laughs> take advice <laughs> from him? Yeah, yeah. He don't yeah. even know. So that's yeah. what I said, almost 30, because I, I felt it in it. Like, yeah, 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 you had to go. He paused for a little bit, he's like, yeah. For me, it felt longer than that. Yeah, he started thinking in the head. Didn't For me, it felt longer than that. Heart answered first, and then the head. Right, but um, there's going to be a lot of people today yes. who know, kind of, they've heard of Tupac, right? Yes, yes, and he's yes, become yes. almost iconic, and they would have heard of Outlaws, yes, uh, yes. almost as urban legend, yes, you know. Yes, true. But they wouldn't really have an idea of how big. Mm. Or, or what an impact you guys made. I mean, true. just to for some of our newer, younger true, listeners, true. what would you say? How I think you... um, true because I, I think the outlaws didn't really blow up until after Pac died. Like I said, when he was alive, he wanted to make sure that we was in the, behind the scene. Like why you why you guys want to be like he catch us on the camera? He, like there's a, actually a YouTube video where Gaddafi, the member of the outlaws, was just like doing an interview, and Pac walked in. Like I told you, look at you. Like Michael Mech said, that t that camera gonna kill you. Always trying to that that, that camera gonna yeah. mess y'all up. Trying to always put yourself out there. Like he was against this. Yeah. So he we were just like rapping like his homies. And when he left, we started. You know, the first record we put out sold 1.5 million records on our own, the Outlaws. Then we started climbing up the ladder. Then we went the ladder. Then we went independent. You know what I mean? So we started to we had to stand on our own two feet after Pac died. You yeah. know what I mean? But we still was always careful with the camera because he already put that in us. So we was a, we was always careful with the open Hollywood. And a lot of people don't know we was blackballed. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, we was blackballed. You got to understand when Pac was alive, he was doing records dissing people who became some of the biggest names in the music industry. When Pac was alive, he was bigger than all these people. But he was doing songs talking bad about him. We was right there with him. Okay. So when he died, these people got big and they used to tell the radios not to play us. They used to try to keep us away uh, from certain things. We made a lot of mistakes too, like did certain things. Like I snatched the mic from Puffy one day on at the MTV Awards, you know. So we made a lot of mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did a lot of crazy things ourselves, but we was really blackballed, so we had to go independent. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they became kind of mainstream. Yeah, and... then later on when we did a deal called, uh, you know, we did a record. I don't want to say it because I want people to run out and try to listen to the record. feel like Googling. A lot of bad words, you know what I mean? But yeah. we finally put this record out and... You know, after lawsuits and everything would drop, it sold 1.5 million records. So then that was even for me the first time I started seeing real money. Okay. You know what I mean? That was the first time, you know, I, the first thing I did after that is went and bought like a brand new Lexus. And you know what I mean? I went and bought a house in a gated community, all million dollar homes, bought my fair share of jewelry. You know, you got to bling, <laughs> you know, waste some money. You know what yeah. I mean? Waste some money. I, so this is quite interesting, actually, because look, 
um, there's a point when it's about the music and then there's a point where it becomes about the business. Yes, yes, yes. yes and yes, I, I, how much did you learn about business through the music industry? You spoke about it before, like a yes, lot yes. of people didn't know much about contracts and then you're coming in. Yes, Putting yes. to side the, the view on music, and I know we speak yes, about this, true. that, you know, clear cut impermissibility because of the lyrics and so on. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, so that's one thing as a product, but actually yes. this is something I often say even about finance is that okay, putting to the side how yes. Uh, the products are haram because of riba, mm. but the way people do business actually yes. is very corrupt as well. They yes, take yes, advantage yes. of the weaker in society and true, true, all of these true. types of things. True. How is what was your experience of business? You know, in business in the music industry is is probably the most corrupt. I would say um, industry in America that with no reper repercussions for the people that's involved in it. And I remember a lawyer told me this. I remember I sat down with a lawyer and he was like, look, and um, this is the only industry that can steal millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, and no one goes to jail. Like, what is this big banker guy who went to jail? Madoff. Bank he Madoff. went to jail. You, you, but the music industry is stealing hundreds of millions of dollars, literally, like, from people. And he told me an incident. And he was like, look, he he got some money back for some old school singers. I forget their name from like the 70s. Somebody from the music industry was stealing the money. They did a P.O. box in Florida. And this industry person said, I send the checks to you. You cash the checks for millions. And they finally won their millions back. But he said, man, this is the only industry that make the mafia <laughs> look innocent. He said, and, and, and he don't know why there's no uh, accountability. You know yeah. what I mean? Imagine if you work for a bank and you find they find out that you stole forty million dollars, they will go to jail. But the music industry is so corrupt that so many people is under their payroll from so many community people. No one will speak out against them. It's crazy. That's madness. Very corrupt. Very how, corrupt. I mean, how did you navigate that? What what, what was the way through it? What your own labels or when we went independent? Um, we went independent and we was making um, twelve dollars a CD. Okay. So we was able to find, you know, a company that said, look, we'll help you guys go independent. You have your own label. We had a label called Outlaw Records. You do everything. We would just help you with a little bit of the distribution because back then rappers didn't print their own records. It yeah. was still a certain type of person who don't let you in that side of the business. So they was the one in control of that. So it, eventually they, they, they always have some type of control. So when we was able to do our own record label, you sell less records, but you make more money. For example, we put out an album and sold 200,000 copies, but we making $12 a CD. Okay. You know what I mean? So 90% of the money coming to us. The company that we signed with as a distribution, they might give us a half a mil up front. Yeah. We paid them back and then the rest hours. You know what and I mean? And was that better? That was better. You that see? was much better because we was finally, the money was coming to us. The checks was coming to us and we was paying ourselves. We give ourselves a monthly salary now. We we yeah. so we had to learn how to do business. You know, we had to buy our own tour bus now. We before the record companies would give you the tour bus and you would drive from here to here and they say, Oh, this costs this amount of money. Like they charge you for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So now we was able to take some money and bought our own vans and we was able to wrap it. We did everything ourselves. We sold our own shirts. We print, we did everything ourselves. You know Alhamdulillah, I mean? like, you know, even you know, coming back to this point about finance and every yes. time I hear about this, I think about the beauty of the Sharia and yes. how it protects the rights of mm. everyone involved. And actually, Spare. it looks at not just what's good for the two parties involved in the contract, but actually society. Because mm. you look, you would think saying millions of records yes. on the face of it, being known everywhere is better. And you're going to have all of these buses going out. But actually, being in a contract where you're getting mm. less on the face of it, but more in a more equitable way, and you've got more involved, you're more involved in the coaches and everything the, along the whole way, you, you're invested in it. Yeah, true, true. You know, alhamdulillah, true. it was less, but there was more barakah from that point of view. The, the contract. I say barakah. No, barakah. <laughs> <laughs> Not from that point of view. No, no, Islamic. No, no, business wise, yeah. From a business point, no, Islamically. From, yeah, like from a business point, it makes sense, yes. You know, yeah. but I would say, yes. not barakah from that point of view, from the blessing side, but, but it definitely made more barakah sense. that there's justice in the contract. Yeah, yeah, justice, that makes sense. Yeah, so when there's, where there's justice, and there will be true, ways true. that actually people live with it better. True, 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 you know? true, true. Um, it was more just to be on your own, you know what I mean? Yeah. Back and, then. And, and being content yes. with less. True. From a face of it, true, true, because true. actually it translated true. to more, you true, know. True, true, true. Uh, and this is important. Yeah. I think this is a lesson for a lot of our kind of listeners that you know, 
we're living in a time where everyone wants to be big overnight and be known. especially yeah overnight, they want this overnight yes. you know what i mean um, they don't um, want to put no work in they just want to wake up and you know it, it happened to some people they yeah. some people started facebooks and some people started these social medias but doesn't mean it's gonna happen for every one of us we got to put some work in absolutely you know I mean? and at a young age giving up your agency like, yes, you know, yes. uh, devolving your power and you won't realize the impact of it. But actually True. slow and steady taking something, taking a long term view on something, True. having less now, inshallah, and doing things the right way, mm. you hope, inshallah, in the long run, it'll be success for you. True, true. You know? Longevity. Longevity. Absolutely. Longevity. And the same is with your money, you know, like putting it away in, 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 a, in a small amount but regular. Mm. You hope it's always going to be better than yeah. just yes. going crazy, taking an approach true, like true, a gambler. True. You know, true. alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of money, um, alhamdulillah, you... I say alhamdulillah, but you were making a lot of money, right? Okay. I, was make, I was making yeah, a lot Yeah, you're making money. a lot of money. <laughs> now... Yes. From the face of it, like yes, you had everything, like house, money, jewelry, yes. everything that a lot of the youth kind of aspire to have, right? You, yes. you must have been the happiest guy in the world, right? I was the most depressed. A lot of people don't know that when I was, um, when I made it the biggest in my career, I was in a gated community, all million dollar homes, brand new cars, money in my bank. Every night I would go to sleep depressed, and I start questioning life, like something is not adding up. You know what I mean, like. How come I have this? I have this house. I have, you know, everything. But where's this happiness? I was very depressed. You know what I mean? I became an alcoholic to the point where I was escaping because I said, you know, I don't, I'm trying to escape the reality of life. And um, I tried everything. Like, bro, I was like, you know what? Maybe because my mother's from Puerto Rico and Cuba. So I was like, you know what? Maybe I don't really know my Puerto Rican side of the family. Maybe this is why I'm not happy. I took a trip to Puerto Rico like I was trying everything and I came back depressed and I was like, I really don't know what's going on. You know, I, I gave up. I didn't even want to care about living anymore. Like I gave, I came so down. I said, man, I don't really care. I can die today. I just want to get away from this because I wasn't happy. You know what I mean? I was just, and I was searching, searching, you know what I mean? And it wasn't until I accepted the religion of Islam, you know, for the first time. Cause I used to go to bed every night and even though I was depressed and unhappy, but I was sitting, I was like, but who made the stars? Yeah, like I, I question this. Like, yeah. how's the, like I'm drunk out of my mind, though. You know what I mean? I'm drunk out of my uh, mind, stuck for the lot. And I'd be like, but who put that sun up in there? Who put the moon? Like, this is how I go to sleep every night. Reminds me of the can... verses in the Quran where Ibrahim alayhi salam, he has this because <laughs> Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's looking, he's trying to find the truth, like you are. Allah, and he goes, I worship the sun, but then the sun sets. Yeah. And then he sees the moon, and but then the moon goes down during the day, and then he goes sees the stars, but the stars disappear. So and he goes, "Verily, my Lord Subhanallah. is Allah, because He is ever living." Subhanallah, okay. Subhanallah. You know, you literally said all of those things. I just was there. searching like who did it, you know what I mean? And then eventually, you know, became Muslim. You know, I got into a, I was in a studio, got into a fist fight with my little brother, and happened to be American Muslim there who broke the fight up, invited me to the mosque. Um, I went there with my gun and 30 friends because I didn't trust Muslims. You know what I mean? I went there with my okay. gun and 30 friends. And when I got in there, I was shocked because now, you know, growing up in church, the church is segregated yeah. by race. So it, it's either all black church or, okay. or white church or Asian church. So when I walked in this masjid, I was shocked because I seen black. It was a majority African-American church in South Central. I mean, not church, masjid in South Central L.A. But then I seen like Pakistani brothers. I'm like, Bangladesh, African, Arabs, Egyptians, white Americans, black Americans, and everybody was getting along. So that's what made me curious about, like, wait a minute. You know what I mean? Prayer time came. The brothers, I like, you should pray with us. Never prayed in my life. You know what I mean? He's like, just go with the flow, whatever you want. You know, just ask God when you put your face down. And all I wanted this time of my life is, like, just peace. Like, tranquil. I wanted, like, happiness. Yeah, and that's yeah. what I prayed for. You know what I mean? And eventually, alhamdulillah, after that, I became Muslim, bro. Subhanallah. 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 Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, one of the things I want to mention, I'm actually going to quote a hadith that you quoted that I actually yes. heard you say, and that's about never being fulfilled. Like you could have all of the worldly desires that you could possibly think of, right? Yes. And, you know, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Salaam. that um, the son of Adam, if you had a valley full of gold, mm. he would want to have two valleys. Subhanallah. And nothing fills his mouth except dust. And you know, when 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 you said that, that like so, so, so. touched uh, touched me as well because um, it's so true that 
you see all of these worldly desires. You could have the fastest car, you could have the biggest house. So, a year later, you're going to want something bigger. You're going to want, want something a bigger more. house. You're going to want a faster car. SubhanAllah. You're just never going to be satisfied What's in enough? the dunya. It's enough, right? death, so, yeah. yeah. And that's what Umar ibn Khattab said. He goes, the, uh, the best richness is the richness of contentment. Mm, so, so. To be content means you're so, the most so, rich. So, so, so. You know, okay. and you think that and yeah, it's true, isn't it's it? It's true, true. Because and then you not you you have less worries. If you say Alhamdulillah, this is what yeah. I have. And I saw the Prophet he said it's always better to look those under you instead of those above you because you would be thankful. Because yes. there's always somebody who's going to have more than us, and there's always somebody who's in a worse position than us. So when you look at the people below you, you would say, Alhamdulillah, I do have a roof over my head. I do live in this place. I do. My kids are healthy. This person may not have it. So it makes you it makes you grateful. I'm going to ask you, know you both something, actually, because, you know, yes. when you're talking about having all these different items, my yes. experience has been that actually, you know, <laughs> you stop owning items and they start owning you. Yes. Right? Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. when I had the normal car, an old car, I'd yes. drive it, I'd park it anywhere, I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. Gets a little <laughs> dent or whatever. <laughs> true, true. Suddenly you get like a bit of a nicer car. Yeah. Always stressing out. Yeah. Have a park it properly. <laughs> I can't take it to this area. Doing this. Oh, there's a little bit of a scratch. It's a bad <laughs> Subhanallah. You know that's so true. <laughs> like so, so. That's I've always so been true. bad with cars, so I didn't give it. Like, I'm the most ignorant person with a car. Like, yeah. Yeah. I used to have a brand new car when I had the brand new Lexus, I told you. And yeah. I used to, it used to break down on the highway because I never I never even knew I had to get an oil change. <laughs> Bro, I was so spoiled that yeah. I used to take it to get dropped off. they give it back. So I remember one time I'm driving on the freeway, yeah. and they'd stop, and somebody's like, how can a brand new car break down? What's wrong with you? Yeah. I was like, I just didn't care. Like these times, I'd never really give a heck. You know, just like, <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> Subhanallah. But no, that's so... Cause but I, I like good things. Sorry, not the country. Yeah, yeah. I like good... And there's nothing wrong with having good things. No, no. Yeah. There's a hadith about that. Yeah. Where, yeah. You know, where um, the Prophet of Islam said, uh, uh, having a, a reliable riding beast yes. um, in a spacious home mm. is one of the things in the worldly life that brings contentment and happiness, bring happiness. Yes. And a good yeah. So it's good to have good things and take care of these good things. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, yeah. there, there is. Uh, it's just the, the the case of being aware of it, and you know, I think what you mentioned there, when like it, it, it owned him, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. You, you start stressing yeah. more about it, no, but you have these things. You, instead of feeling better, you're you're yeah. more stressed. Yeah, yeah. You know, true, these true, things true, start true. becoming like you know. That's more why it's good to get used cars, bro. Like my, yeah. I have, yeah. like I got used cars, like all yeah. my cars, because in Saudi it's different. Like in America, you can just get you have. Uh, you can just go and say, "I want this brand new car." He go a down payment, give me a lease, and my credit yeah. is in Saudi. There's no credit. There's no credit. You either come it. with all the cash, or and that's it. it so when you start saying, "Man, school, my kids, or a nice ride," which one is more important? Let me it's just get this used car. So when yeah. you see scratches and everything, you don't care, bro. I'm, I'm like, how did it? Like, because in Saudi, it's probably the only place you would see a Bentley or Rolls Royce with tape on the bumper. Like they, <laughs> they just come with the program. Everybody, home, they don't even care about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they say you hold things. I, I, I forget who said the statement is better to hold material things like money in your hand and not in your heart. Yes. Um, Very important, you know what I mean? You hold it in your hand and because and, once it hit the heart, it's difficult. You, you know, know what? what I mean? it's, this reminds me of something uh, Habib said on the podcast that fighting was in his hands, not in his heart. So it was wow. easy for him to let it go. Wow. Cause, Did um, he ever mention what's the real reason he stopped fighting? Yeah, that's Because I heard his mother was the one, no? It, it, no, it wasn't just that. He actually said um, that, you know, people, uh, like he climbed the mountain to see the world, mm. right? Mm. Uh, and he'd seen it and he'd done it he achieved it yes. and he wasn't he didn't have that hunger the desire for anymore he didn't wow. have anything to prove to anyone mm. yeah, and yeah, he yeah, said yeah. to him don't fight anymore Alhamdulillah. it wasn't like oh it's something he's got to fight against you know no no of course that you know? No, he, then, we know he's not afraid of these, these yeah guys. Alhamdulillah. but it's, it's good that he was able to get out with his health because yeah, he, you exactly. know, most people when they're involved in this type of industry they can't they just they waste their money they you know so they keep fighting even beyond their prime Yes, and they don't even want to, but they have no other choice. You know what I mean? So it's good that he was able to get out of it and with his health. It was very enough. smart, and and now enough. doing something positive with that, and mm. and bring up the next set of fighters. Okay, um, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So I want to ask the yes. the producer who first kind of said to you, broke up the fight between you and your brother. Yes, you still in touch with him, or is of he course, Macau, we still in touch. Um, definitely, man, because I look at it like a lot sent him to save my life. You know what I mean? So. I'm in touch with him on social media, WhatsApp. We we in touch. I think he moved to Ethiopia. He's American, but he living in Ethiopia doing some work over there. You know what I mean? Is he well known? He's not. No, nah, he's very behind the scene. He was a, he wasn't a big big producer. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't think, I think he was behind the scene. He worked on a few like R&B, you know, he, he introduced us to a singer named Seal. He's from London, you know, you know Seal? Seal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the two, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, of course, I man. actually did a song with him. Really? Yeah, bro, I used to hang out was with Was it Kissed by a Rose? No, yeah. Seal was oh. a homie, bro. Like, <laughs> a lot of people don't know Seal was the homie. Really? Like, I used to hang out with him. Still, Still was like it a, comes across a bit. Bro, Still there's, was a, there's a word. When that, there's when a geezer. When that camera was <laughs> bougie around, bougie is a, a word. Yeah. One of our guys uses. Yeah, he was acting bougie, but when that camera was around, he was gangster, bro. I, could, I was. Really? Sorry. I used to hang out with him. Yo, I used to hang out with him. Yeah, I think I scared him though one time. That's the last time I ever seen him. Not me personally, yeah. but I brought some hood people to the studio, and I think after that, he's like, "I'm not bringing this guy around <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I'll take him anywhere." <laughs> okay, but he was a very so this guy Macau was working on the project with Sil. And um, doing some music behind the scene. And when I met Sil, even from the Outlaws, I was always the one who was, a, I, I like to approach people. So when I knew who Sil was. He had the kiss from the rose. He was a, he was a legend at, yeah. that, at that time. So I went up to him and I was like, what's up, bro? How's everything? And we used to hang in the studio and stuff. Believe it or not, Sil, bro, I was shocked when I seen how he used to kick it in the studio. Like, wow, this is Sil, the same guy. <laughs> he was kicking it like a gangster, G. <laughs> so this Macau guy eventually... We was able to do a song with Sil. I'm the one convinced Sil, like, bro, I'm work we working on an independent album. We the outlaws from Tupac. Would you join us on a song? He said, sure, no problem. He came and got on the song with us. He got it approved from his record label, tried to fight against it. He said, no, give it to him. Um, I don't want a penny back from you guys. He was like, I'm not charging you. So Macau was being slick. The guy who invited me to the mad shit, he was like, well, since I got him to Sil to do all his favor, I need a favor from you. I'm like, what? He's like, I want you to meet me in Damas. So that's how I had to pay him back. You know what I mean? And he would call me and I'd be like, man, this guy need to stop calling my phone. But I, I, I promised him. <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah. but I have to go to the mad shit because I promised him. He gave us a song with Sil. Let me just go up there. You know, took my gun, 30 friends and went. <laughs> You're thinking that most peop people don't know him. They know you now, alhamdulillah. Yes. And it's, it's. Um, it's that, that value, that weight of a good word. Yeah, yeah, yeah bro. Yeah, may Allah you know, bless him. May Allah bless Ameen. him, man. I mean, man. He really... <laughs> He was patient with me, you know what I mean? He was patient with me so many times. He tell a story that one time, like, he saved my life again. I was a new Muslim, and I was trying to get in the club. They didn't want me to go in the club, and I was mad. I said, I'm going to get my gun. I'm coming to shoot everybody. And he talked me out of it. Uh, <laughs> so every time I was in these crazy areas, he was uh, giving me some talk, you know? Well, so bless a lot bless him, man. Yeah, a lot bless him. I mean, I mean, you know? I mean. <laughs> now, um, you, you mentioned the experience when he first entered the masjid and he saw... Yes, the brothers yes. from all these backgrounds and stuff. What was the experience like when you made your first such that when you Man, it actually was um I felt free, bro. Like when I the first time I put my face down and 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 he's and I remember him telling me, he said, Look, when you pray, because I didn't know how to mix a lot. He said, Just do whatever you see the people doing, just join us. But when you pray, you know, and put your face on the floor, you talking directly to God. So whatever you want, ask God. You know what I mean? At that particular time in my life, I had money, everything. The only thing I didn't have was in the happiness. I didn't have peace. I didn't have any happiness inside, you know? So when I put my face on the floor, I would pray to God. I said, oh, God, not a lot. Guide me to a way of life that would bring me my happiness. The only thing I was concerned with. Then he gave me literature, Quran, and literature, of, you know, the prophet, the sahabas. I remember driving home. And I'm like, I just need to read these books. I was urged to read these pamphlets. And I started, I couldn't stop reading. You know, I'm reading the names that my grandmother taught me growing up in church and, and as a Christian. Like we believe, you know, Christians believed in Moses and Abraham yes. and Isaac. I grew up believing in these prophets. So when I read it, that these are the same prophets in Islam, I was surprised. And then I read about the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and That's the lovely. things that he came with. And then I was like, this is it. This is why yeah. I'm not happy because yeah. I'm living my life and in, in opposition to what the way God created me for and I remember calling a brother I was like I'm ready to become Muslim subhanAllah you know alhamdulillah and, and that was um 2002 20 years ago yeah so, 20, you done numbers, 21 man. years 21 years coming to us 21 years but you, you're excuse only turned uh, yeah, yeah. 21 the other day <laughs> mashallah alhamdulillah alhamdulillah you know I've got to say I don't know if you're feeling this as well Saf, right but most people say, alhamdulillah, they're going to listen to you and see you. And they feel, well, this guy was a gangbanger. This guy was like, you know, you're talking now. To think about you going and pulling a gun. I wasn't a gangbanger. I, no. I was affiliated to gangs. Though. No, no. Oh, sorry. When I, I say I that. Wasn't, yeah, but I get you. I guess yeah. you were saying that someone's going to go pull a gun. <laughs> like, just the thought of someone yes, like you yes. going, grabbing a gun, yeah, like going, like, doing some madness. I was a little crazy, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was a little out of my mind. Like, if you speak, you know, I... 
we have a podcast show that I, I interviewed the outlaws and I remember Noble, young Noble from the outlaw. He said, Moo, we used to think you had a death a wish. He's like, now to see you change your life, you live in Saudi Arabia, you smiling. I didn't even used to smile. Yeah, this one. Bro, I couldn't even smile. I didn't know how to smile. Uh -huh. Like I look at my pictures from the past, I, I just couldn't smile. I, was, I felt dead in the inside. You know what I mean? Yeah. With, to smile back then, it, I, used, I used to have to like force it. Yeah. You understand? And they like, now we see that you smile. We thought we would never see this. We thought you have a death wish because I go into a club and just start a fight with 30, 40 people. And to the point where they stopped going out with me, like they, I, like I said, I started ruining my career. I was getting mad at Puffy, snatched the mic from him at the MTV Awards. Like I was doing crazy. I didn't really care, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Allah saved me so many times. <laughs> now I want to be the furthest away from any violence. Yeah. Anything negative, just keep me away from it and keep it away from me. You know, you know, no, alhamdulillah, like it's been such an amazing pleasure having spending time with you. And, and it's not like suddenly you switch it on and once the camera's off, like, yeah, yeah, the scowling is it? <laughs> Is that, no, that's what I'm saying. It's hard to. Be, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, that's what I'm saying. It's hard. People may be listening to this, and, yes, and that's what I'm saying. Especially the newer crowd, yes. not really appreciating what you came from, what yes, it was yes, like. Yes, yes. You know, yeah, and to give up that because that, yeah. from a, a lifestyle perspective, and then all of the wealth, yes, actually yes, obscene yes, amounts yes. of wealth. Yes. You know. Um, but and you gave it up. That was a decision that I you had made. To give it up, bro. Because you know, um, like I said, I went so many years on my last years in the music industry, unhappy, depressed, suicidal thoughts. You know, like I didn't want to. It's to the point that I I used to wish somebody shoot me. Like I I I wanted to give up on life. You understand? So when I became Muslim, it was easy to give up because when I had it, I said it didn't make me happy anyway. So why am I fighting for this? You know what I mean? Um, as you said earlier, the Hadith, you give up something for the sake of Allah, he give you something better in return. So I just wanted to get away from this and just start all over again. And it was difficult, don't get me wrong, it, and it didn't happen overnight. It was very difficult because when I lost, it, it, went to, it went to a time when I hit rock bottom. So I was sleeping on the floor. My son Muhammad, my second, my first, oldest son Salik, and then I had a second, I became Muslim, got married. My second son Muhammad, when he was six months old, bro, I was sleeping on the floor. I had nothing. You know, I tried to do Hijra. I went to the Emirates because my wife family, they're Emirati from Abu Dhabi. So I went there and I was trying to go to Saudi. The person who promised me the visa in Saudi, he just, I, can, I can't believe people lie like this. He just turned his back on me and I was shocked. And so I didn't have any money. So all the money was gone. Big shout out to Mike Epps. You know Mike Epps? Mike Epps, yeah, yeah. You know Mike Epps, yeah. yeah, yeah. The big shout out to Mike Epps because I was calling back home like, my visa up, I got to get back home. I need plane ticket. I don't have any money. Whoever give me the airline ticket, I'll pay you back. A lot of people's like, nope, nope, nope. I call my caps like, bro, I hate to act. Me, I don't like to ask. I'm the type of person I can yeah. be dying from thirst. I'm not asking for nothing. I just can't do it. Like my pride kicking. Yeah. But this time I said, it's for my family. I have to leave. I have to go back to America. And I called Mike Epps. I said, look, bro, can you help me with plane tickets for me, my wife? My son is only six months old. He don't need a plane ticket. And when I get back to America, I figure where I'm going to pay you out. Because I've always been a hustler. Yeah. So I knew somewhere I'm going to make some money to give it back to yeah. him. You know what yeah. I mean? So he called me back. He was like, look, he, first, he's, what's your name of everybody? He called me back. Like, I booked tickets for you, your wife, and I got a ticket seat for your son. And you don't have to pay me back. Man, I guide him to Islam. I keep Amen. Paying. And he never took it back. You know what I mean? So when I went home, I didn't have nothing. You know what I mean? I think the last thing I had, that Tupac gave me a Rolex bracelet. That right now is probably worth a million dollars. You know what I mean? So he gave me this Rolex bracelet. And I was like, I don't wear gold anyway. My son is more important. You know what I mean? My family, my wife, they deserve to have rights over me. So I sold it. I called Mike Epps. I was like, man, I got to sell this. He's like, you sure, man? I don't want to do it. I said, bro, just, you know, just buy it off of me. I took the cash and I started trying to hustle, get back on my feet. You know what I mean? But it was difficult because I used to, I was so broke that I used to go to my, I was living in my brother's house at this time. And I used to go look, lift up his pillows and take change and quarters just to buy diapers for my son. You know what I mean? So I lost everything that I shipped thinking I'm moving to Saudi. I had like containers and stuff that we shipped. I didn't even have the money to bring it back. So I didn't have no clothes. So the only clothes I had left was a few thobes. So I'm going to try to get a job. I can't even afford a new outfit. So I'm trying to get a job and I'm walking in places with thobes on and everybody looking at me like, is this guy crazy? He think we're going to hire. If he come in here trying to get a job just like this, you think we're going to hire this guy? Yeah. So it just, it just hit rock bottom. So eventually, 
you know, right before I moved to Emirates, left the Emirates, I bought oil. I gave it to a friend of mine, a Pakistani brother who, who was born and raised in Emirates. Shout out to Ubaid. I sent this to him. I left the money with him. I said, give me this oil, oil, oil and oil and stuff and send it to me in America. So when he sent it to me, I went to the mash and I started selling, hustling. Yeah. My first $20. I f bro, I felt good because I used to get checks for $500 back in the day and I never signed. I never cashed them. I used to feel like that's not real money. Now I don't have nothing. I'm thinking like, where's these checks at? This and this and that. So I always tell people the best days of my life is when I lost everything. Wallahi, brother, the best days because I was appreciating every penny that I made. And I remember when I, I got enough money to rent. I used to be in Lexus trucks, bro, coming to the mad shit and BMWs, Lexus. I was arrogant. I would never drive like a Hyundai. I used to say, you would never catch me in this type of car. But when I lost everything and I made some money, I remember I had my first hundred dollars, bro. Imagine you feel, I felt rich. I'm like, wow, this is a hundred dollars. Then I rent, went and got a rental car, a hoopty. <laughs> <laughs> like a hoopty. I'm driving, barely can drive. Tick, 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 boom, tick, tick. But I, I felt like I was in a bins. And then I got my apartment. When I got the apartment, I didn't even have furniture. I literally no furniture, sleeping on the floor. But because I did everything on my own, halal, it just felt good. You know what yeah. I mean? I was appreciative to every penny. So I'm glad that Allah took me to that. Because before I went cash certain checks, certain amount of money, I said, it's not real money. Why well, I'm wasting my time and going, waiting in the line. So I had to I had to go. So when people see me on Instagram now and they see me promoting my restaurant or they see me promoting this, they don't know what I went through to get to that. Yes. They just look at it like, oh, man, look at this guy who helping them with money. They don't know. You know what I mean? I did everything I had. It took some time. It didn't happen overnight. But I, I really can sell, tell, say to the people that's involved in a certain lifestyle that's haram that Allah promised us. You know that if you the prophet said something, if you leave something for the sake of Allah, He would give you something better in return. We just gotta believe, we gotta have tawakkul. We we have to know for a fact, like look, if Allah said it, He's gonna do it. I don't care. My family used to think I was crazy. Yeah. My brother used to call me like when I was living with my brother. You know what I mean? He's Muslim now. You know, me and my brother always yeah. been like this. But he thought Islam made me crazy. You know, because yeah. people was coming to me saying, "Look, we want you to be the manager. I mean, the CEO of this record company. Some American football player. We want you to be the CEO of this record company. Music. We'll pay you a salary of a hundred twenty thousand a year, which is good money." And I said no. So my brother's like, man, Islam made my brother stupid. This is what I heard him tell somebody on the phone. Oh, wow. <laughs> I heard him tell somebody on the phone, like, yo, Islam made this dude, this dude stupid. Yeah, yeah. And then eventually, now my brother, he get it. You know, he, he became Muslim and now he get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It's so interesting you mentioned that because I'm, I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to science, right? And <laughs> we, we talk about time as a constant. And then now with science, you know that space and time is different depending on if you're near a black hole, for example, time moves differently. And the example I always try to give people is Allah sees time mm. as he wants. He doesn't see it as we do. So having that duwako and giving up everything that you did, you went through the struggles in the short term. But in the long term, when you look back at it, you're like, you you went through that and your brother also saw that. So yeah, alhamdulillah, it's so, so, so good to hear. Yeah, alhamdulillah, thank Allah. You know what I mean? Doesn't mean life is perfect. We still gonna face some hardships, yeah. but alhamdulillah, Allah, we see that Allah comes through. You know what I mean? That's what the, the Muslims, we always have to believe that and know that, you know what I mean? Because there's so many people that's, they probably, they want like, they probably say, how can I make money if I leave this haram life? Who's gonna pay my bills? They don't really know that Allah, the provisions of the heavens and the earth belong to Allah. You know what I mean? We have to. You might go through a struggle a little bit, but does eventually Allah will, He always come through? You know what I mean? Alhamdulillah. This is uh, Allah tells us in the Quran that whoever has taqwa of Allah, uh, He will make a makhraj for them, uh, mm. an exit. And you see the understanding of this is you see mm. like this room that has four walls mm. and a top. It's not it'll make you a door. Mm. That when we think of a door as an exit, mm. Allah Azza wa Jalla will rip a way through for you, mm. even if you're completely encased. If you have taqwa of Allah, sa, sa. that He will make a way out of it for you. And, and we can't see it. And you see, when you think about the music industry and so on, people kind of identify that as a clear haram or people who make money from alcohol or sure. drugs, right? We yes. see that as clear haram. Yes. Um, but more than all of this, Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us and reminds us. That he's at war with those who deal with riba interest. And they say that's the only sin that Allah promised to, rage, to go to war with a person is riba. Riba, exactly. SubhanAllah. And how people today don't give it that weight that it's wrong. Right? That's you deep, know? Akhisa. 
you know and, and this is the problem we because oh. people may think that your lifestyle is very different from theirs but actually when you break it down from mm. something that was wrong and leaving something that was wrong going through some hardship and now alhamdulillah yeah. trying to find your way through life so. in a way that's pleasing to Allah this yeah. journey everyone can perhaps relate to so, 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 because so. on some level Everyone's yes. involved in something they shouldn't be. Sahih, sahih, you know, sahih, and and, sahih. and finance is one of those things that it touches everyone. The number mm. of uh, Muslims you speak to who are involved in riba-based loans, yeah, or yeah, yeah. they're working in companies, working for banks, or working for other financial sahih, institutions, sahih, sahih, sahih. and they don't think anything of this. They take they think light of it. You know what I mean? That's true. And this is the only sin Allah promised to fight you on your mukiyama with. Yeah. So that means this is not something we should take it's, lightly. It's not a joke at all. It, it destroys societies, bro. Absolutely. You know, society. So, you know, if, for example, if I was a drug dealer, that destroyed probably a certain community. Yeah. Yes. Those who are involved in it and those who are using it. So, but Reba touches everybody. Everybody. The whole the guilty, system. The guilty, the, the whole system. So you can see why it's not permissible. You know what I mean? Because there's no good come out of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And especially when you look at the developing world and the the, the developed, as they like to call yeah, it, yeah, 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 <laughs> because all of the <laughs> all of the, the the hardship and the oppression is on those countries that can't afford to get out, even though they make enough money because they're paying interest. Yeah, like Haiti, you know, yeah, if you look course. at Haiti, yeah, yeah. Haiti, they're still paying a debt to France to this day. Yeah, and you know, certain African countries, they still like with interest. They paying interest for uh, what? France, France, wow. Pilot. France doesn't have a single gold mine, yet it owns hundred tons of gold. Because wow. even the former colonies, yes. uh, the last I read was at least fourteen of them, eighty-five percent of their wealth has to be invested in the French stock markets. Wow! Despite being decolonized, this is the new slavery. You know, it this is. is the new. It is. You know, this is the new slavery. When you see what happened with these artists, with these entertainers. They can't even speak out like how we mentioned earlier how Pac was able to he he did something when he put his career on the line, his life, his freedom. When he seen these two cops, you know, beating up the black guy, he went out and actually did something physically, shot him, went to jail, got off the hook. Nowadays, you can't even speak out. Nowadays, these new artists, they got them so clogged up with they got them by the, the claw. They can't even say anything wrong. Now, the new slavery is what you say, whatever the masses say, he cut these checks. Yeah. You Absolutely. know what I mean? Cut these checks. So if we want you to push this agenda, you shut your mouth and push this agenda. You know what I mean? So you see, historically, people who were enslaved knew they were slaves, and so when they had their opportunity, they would fight for freedom. Yes. Today we're slaves that think we're free. Know. Yeah. Nowadays you will find a billion a billionaire slave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> it's true, it bro. It's true. It's you know, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know? right, real talk. Yeah, subhanAllah, I'm just thinking about it. And I, this is advice to our, our kind of Allah brothers and sisters Allah. who are involved in money that comes from impermissible sources. There'll never be any khair in it. Never be a khair. And, and you will never really fully, it will never help at all. It might push you back one step, but it's going to take you back five steps when you're dealing Absolutely. with anything haram. You're making money from haram. And you have to realize that Allah is the one. He's a razak He's the provider. So we have a chance of getting blessings from Allah by being obedient to Allah. So it's almost like we think we outsmarting a lot, like, or we don't really trust a lot that we feel we got to go the fast way because we don't believe a lot really going to come through. But a lot, if he's the provider, you know what I mean? So like for the same way, if we got a job, we go, we want to please our boss. Yeah. We would listen to our boss. Allah's, he's, he's your boss, boss. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> yeah. Boss of so, bosses. Yeah. He's the boss of all bosses. <laughs> no, it's some interesting topics that you uh, guys mentioned about how we are now desensitized to a lot of these things because True. they're the norm, like with the likes of Raba. But being specific to the music industry, which you've come from and you gave that up. And uh, I remember hearing you say that, um, don't listen to your music and yes, your yes, music yes. because of certain ex explicit lyrics, you know, how you may have spoken about women and yes. uh, violence and things like that. Yes. What you notice nowadays is you open TikTok, okay? Mm the top trending tracks, mm. more often than not, will have very explicit lyrics, right? You've mm. got children using these pieces of music yeah. on videos. You've got parents with children posting videos with explicit lyrics. Yes, yes. You know, it, we are so desensitized to it. When, when, you, when you see that now, having come from your background, how does that make you feel? It's, it's sad, bro. You know what I mean? Where um, It's very sad. Like, you know what I mean? It, sh it shows the impact 
of the music on people. You know what I mean? So when we say to people, don't listen to my music or don't do this, they think we overdoing it. Like, come on, yeah. man, it's just music. They're having fun. But no, you, you like like you said, the parent is with their child probably listening and dancing to something that's crazy, explicit lyrics. and But they don't realize that this is going to affect their kids. You know what I mean? It's going to affect them because subconsciously per, people are enslaved by music. You know what I mean? Subconsciously, where yeah. it affects them. You know, Toronto University did a study years ago, and it was speaking only about musical instruments, not even the lyrics. It was talking about how musical instruments, it controls a person spiritually, like mentally, it has an effect on them. Um, and it said to the point that certain music releases dopamine in the brain. This is Toronto University. The same chemical that a person releases when they take hardcore drugs such as cocaine. So imagine this. You heard that crack? That's yeah, what you, yeah. heard. you said. I'm not 45 years old. I might not look it, but you, you heard that crack, yeah. bro. So, <laughs> so they said that this chem, that music releases a chemical that hardcore drugs releases when when they take. It. So it shows the effect of it. And even us, like growing as a musician, you know, and, and a person who used to listen to music. There's a music for everything. There's a musical. If you want to go do something haram, you play this music. If you want to go chill, you play this type of music because it puts you in a mood. You understand? So they not really, people don't really realize the effect how, how music control them. So many people wake up depressed and they don't know why they sad, but they went to sleep with headphones and headphones and they sit and say, I'm not happy. They shows that music leads to depression. You understand? So it's so much, it affect the people in so many ways that I'm sure more studies will come up with even more, you know, things yeah, that, yeah, that, that we should stay away from. You know what I mean? So you letting your kids do these type of things and, you can't really get mad at them when they come home and they they using drugs in your home because certain music pushes these things now. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's a lifestyle and culture that lifestyle. comes with the time with that yeah. type of music as well, isn't it? Totally. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, you know, man. like when you hear some of the lyrics and how they're referring to women, for instance, and then yeah, yeah. you know, you see the impact on young men and how they True. talk about women in certain True. ways because of the music that they've been music. listening they think this masculine they think masculine now their music will have you thinking to be disrespectful to a woman is masculine this is the one of the biggest tricks of the shaitan like how are you a masculine you disrespecting a woman you know what i mean when i read about the sahaba and the prophet Sallallahu these was real men yeah. yes these are men who conquered persia roman the byzantines but they was the most respectful towards women. They were soft towards their women. The Prophet Sallallahu said, those who are the best of people from my ummah, those who are best to their women. You know what I mean? The Prophet was a real man. He was good to his women. So yeah. when you got music, is teaching the people the opposite. Yeah. You know what I mean? They they stripping them away, everything from a mat. From nowadays, the, what what the youth think is masculinity is actually the more the opposite. I mean, even, I mean? It's not even uh, men and women. It's just how they speak to each other. It's yeah, become acceptable yeah. yes. to be derogatory. And you're opening the door for yes. other people to disrespect you. True, 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 true. You know, you know I mean? and you're allowing that to happen and you're perpetuating that, which is a problem, which is why you'll see that certain types of music and the culture that comes with it are allowed to be promoted within certain communities. Let me tell you something. So rap music, good thing you said that because now rap music, the number one consumer for rap music in America are white kids. Yeah. This is the, like, it hit the suburbs. So I try to tell people when they have these countries where maybe they think they're doing stuff for tourism or they think they're doing something and they bring in this music and they bring they bring in a lifestyle that comes yeah. with it. They don't know. You know what I mean? They don't know that there's a lifestyle that comes with, especially hip-hop music. I can talk about hip-hop music because I was part of it. I believe, and, 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 and maybe I played a part of it, but I believe hip-hop music destroyed more of our community than anything else as, as far as in the African-American community. Because right now you have a lot of people killing each other because the the music nowadays is gun culture, yeah. the trap music and these everybody talking about killing. You have more killing in the black community now based on hip hop music. I believe it's destroying the community. You know, worse than crack did in the eighties. Hip hop is the number one enemy to black Americans. I'm and this yeah. as a I see what it's doing to our people. So when people say no, but we making money and you making money, you living in your mansions. Expense. But these people that's listening to your music, what are you doing for them? They, you got kids that's listening to music and they want to be a gangster now and they pulling out guns, killing each other while you and your mansion chilling. Yeah. Now even rappers is not safe. You look how many rappers is getting killed. Yeah. So imagine if this if music, for example, rap music come from America. They couldn't contain it. It's destroying the people that created it. It's destroying us. Yeah. Now you bringing this to your country, you bringing this to your home. What do you think is going to happen? It comes with a lifestyle. 
and, and they might not realize that music really affects this. So when you, we come and we say, don't let music come, they say, oh, you extremists. I, we know what comes next. I'm yeah. just telling you as a former yeah. rap artist, you might think it's innocent having these, bringing these, these, these concerts and these rappers, but you don't know what's coming next. Yeah, you don't know the absolutely. alcohol is coming, the drugs is coming, the fornication is coming. Are you ready for that? Because that's coming next. You know what I mean? And it's the reality. And this Hickman, this is this is a path that you've trodden, so you can say that. Yes, you know? yes, yes. And um, definitely, because now that you've left and you're looking in on it, and it's the same with credit, believe mm. it or not. You see, yes. when you want to destroy society, you open up credit. And I remember when they started introducing it in parts of the developing world, it's, oh, but people want to buy cars and they want to buy houses. You're allowing them to do it. Yes. Oh, you don't see what you're doing, right? There, there's a housing crisis in the UK where today mm. the children and grandchildren of those Muslim immigrants even and those people who bought their houses with a mortgage and they're crying because their kids can't buy houses. But what was the cause? was them getting loans to buy their houses, which pushed up the price of their houses in the areas that they want to live in as Muslims. Wow. And they don't realize the impact of it. And that was credit. There's a direct wow. correlation between house prices and credit. Mm, you see? And yeah. but, but when you tell them, oh, why are you being so fanatical about it? Why yeah, are you being yeah, an yeah, extremist? Yeah. Can't we buy a nice house? Shouldn't we buy? We <laughs> want to buy a nice like, car. Yeah, Islam tells you to yeah. buy, but do it the proper no, way. Exactly. You know what I mean? Do it the proper way. Yeah. That's why I appreciate moving to Saudi Arabia because coming from America, if you have good credit, you get anything. Yeah. You can have good credit and people can just say, okay, my credit is this, my this and that. You get a you get a loan for a house, but then you ruin it because you might not yeah. be able to keep it up. Saudi is no credit. They go they judge you by your salary. Yeah. So if your salary is this, you can buy this car. If your salary is this, you buy this. If you, they don't play that credit <laughs> <Yeah>. stuff. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. 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 Now in Saudi, um, and if you don't pay debt, sorry, in Saudi yeah. you go to jail. Some people think this harsh, but I. So it make people afraid to take loans out. Yeah. That, that's phenomenal, actually, because yeah. in the West we live on a on, on a credit basis. True. True. Yeah. True. You know, true. I know you don't like Klarna, and for the same reason, buy now, pay later. Wow. How much they're pushing into children, like you know, oh buy this shirt this shirt or this t-shirt or this dress mm. that you can't afford but paying installments yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so suddenly wow. now you've got all of these items that you don't wear you don't need but now you're paying debt you're paying on. and you can't pay it this is the thing they say paying installments yeah, yeah. but guess what many people many will not yes. be able to pay it back in those installments and then mm. in comes riba right so it's wow. disguised as oh yeah take this right now don't worry you pay it back interest free yeah, yeah, yeah. interest free but guess what most people are not going to be able to afford that. True, and then true, they true, will true. pay interest. And this is what's really dangerous because, you know, it's, slick with it. it's not straight in your face. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah I, nowadays that, they're doing it slick. <laughs> As Umar wow, said, wow. It, it really makes me angry. When I see stuff like that, <laughs> it really makes me angry. But subhanAllah. Now in Saudi, yes, look, we're, yes. we're going to go a bit more positive. Now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, Alhamdulillah, you've uh, you know you've got your own businesses. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about your businesses? Alhamdulillah, man. Um, I've been in Saudi for twelve years now. Um, me and my partners, we have a, a restaurant, a smoke barbecue restaurant called Smoky Beers. Alhamdulillah, is doing well. You know, my partners. Shout out to the partners, Saud, um, Sunny, our time, Uncle Yazid, um, and um, we started this business. I would say about four years ago, right before the COVID. You know, I got a call from my friends. Um, they are, they're Albanian Americans, and they was living in um, Texas, and they wanted to do to bring a business to Saudi Arabia. And they wanted to do Italian restaurant. I was like, no, nah, that's saturated. Do something different. Do something like some Southern barbecue. I never had smoked barbecue in my life because I had barbecue, of course, but on the West Coast, smoked barbecue wasn't popular. It was mainly something in the South and the Midwest. So he's like, when you come, I want you to try this thing called smoked brisket. Have you ever had it? I was like, no, but let's try it. When I tried, it, I was like, bruh. This is this good killing in Saudi. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, we got to do this. You know what I mean? So eventually we was able to open it up, even though you have a few smoked brisket joints now. But consistency is very important. My partners, they have probably like 25 or 30 years. Um, the Albanian brothers, um, Artan and, and Sonny, for example, I think they got about 30 years experience in a restaurant business. So when they came on board, they do everything. They don't play. Like I told you, uh, one of you guys I was explaining to at the beginning, it was like a defect in the taste of the meat before we open and he spent the night in the restaurant and every hour he would check to see which way the fire was burning something crazy like the uh, wood would sit here yeah. until he find out what was the defect problem of the meat and then he, he found it 
He's like, because of this. And, and so he's, they one of these, mashallah. So the quality of meat, the consistency haven't changed. We get Americans who know barbecue, yeah. like Texas cowboys that walk up in the shop. I ain't even know it was that many Americans there. <laughs> and they know all about barbecue. Yeah. And they always give us and say, this is one of the best we ever tried in the world. So when you guys come to Riyadh, you got to try it. Inshallah. 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 <laughs> Inshallah. We'll have to come down. <laughs> I, I, I love smoke brisket. Yeah. Man. yeah I, it is. I you had it. to, bro. Tender is slow cooked. Was it 20 hours, we say? So up to about 20, from 16 to 24 hours. Oof. You know, we got ribs. We got Russian ribs. We got American ribs. Um, what else? Australian. Yeah. You know, because Saudi, the government allows certain farms to ship into Saudi Arabia. Yeah. What happened is the American, the Saudi embassy, for example, in America, they will go to the farm and see if they're cutting the Zabiha and everything and they give them a certificate. Yeah. And say, well, you're the only ones who can ship to Saudi. So yeah. we, we got one in Russia, America, and Australia. Amazing. You know what I mean? So you guys got to come through. Inshallah. Yeah. What's, what's the name of the place? Smoky Beards. Smoky Beards. Beards. Uh, smoky nice. beards. Smoky uh, beards. And we got, there's and we a got, D. There's a D at the end of it because I thought you said smoky beards. That's my East Coast. That's my East Coast. That's my East Coast. Smoky said, beards. Because all of us beards. got beards. <laughs> yeah. And if you have a beard, you get a free drink. Really? Oh. So that's, 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 All right. the, that's the hit we're, we're definitely coming now, inshallah. <laughs> and, and what other plans do you have? So now we, we open it up four more brands, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. We um, open it up. Um, I don't want to go, we want to surprise the world sure. when we do it, but yeah, we opened yeah. it up four more brands in Riyadh. And I also, a friend of mine bought my coffee brand um, to call MW Cafe, he bought the coffee brand to Riyadh so people can come check out, we got specialty coffee, yeah. you know what I mean? So, inshallah, some plans, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I've got to say, I mean, for our viewers, <laughs> like uh, speaking to Brother Mutai earlier and um, a bit of a coffee connoisseur myself, if I may say so. Yes, and yes, we were discussing yes. coffee and like, mashallah, man knows his coffee. That yeah, was, yeah, coffee, coffee. You know, and you went shopping around Istanbul to make sure you yeah, get some proper Google, coffee. Yeah. I said, what is the specialty coffee <laughs> name? Specialty yeah. coffee, yeah. Seven minute walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I'm going to get it, you know. Wow. So coffee is something that, that I, I love, bro. You yeah. know what I mean? I, I love, you know, it's part of my heritage. We actually about to start shipping Puerto Rican coffee for the first time in 100 years. Puerto Rican having shipped out high quality coffee, believe it or not, in a hundred years. It was the best coffee that they used to import into Europe. It was called the coffee of the the, the kings and um, prince and, and things like that because when the Spanish ruled Puerto Rico, yeah. when they occupied Puerto Rico, sorry, colonized Puerto Rico, they yeah. used to ship most of the Puerto Rican coffee to Europe. And it was coffee that the Pope and the kings was the only one to drink it. And what happened is um, this coffee, Puerto Rico is also the first in Northern North America to grow coffee. So I have a lot of strong culture within coffee. But when America took over, most of the workers went to mainland USA and they started neglecting the coffee. So we have a friend named Dominico, Puerto Rican, who's been on the island for years. And we helping the farmers get back to specialty coffee. Good. And now we finally at the level where we going to start shipping, you know, coffee from Puerto Rico. The first shipment would be in Saudi Arabia. God willing. Inshallah. Looking Inshallah. forward to yeah. that. Yeah. He's, forward he's to like... That. You've really appealed to me and Omar because we both love yeah. beef and yeah. we coffee, love coffee. coffee. coffee so it's just like, all right, tick both boxes. Yeah, you got to come visit, man. You got to come Inshallah. visit. Now, what advice would you give to somebody who maybe is, you know, dealing in a haram business and, you know, who's feeling the same feelings of unhappiness that you felt? What advice would you give them? To leave it, you know what I mean? And it's not, you, you uh, of course, strategize properly, but, you know, some things you just got to leave because you would never leave it if you keep giving yourself an excuse. Maybe next year, maybe one month. You know, you just got to leave, repent, and find something better because there's always something better. You know what I mean? Even if you got to get a normal job, even if you got to, you know, you know, change jobs or um, change professions. You know what I mean? Because there's more halal than haram out here. So you just got to leave it. Inshallah, may Allah Inshallah make, make it easy. easy. I mean, for I mean. everyone. And you used told us a, an amazing kind of stat earlier about the spending power of the African-American community in the U.S. Yes. Can you just repeat yes. it just so I, everyone hears this? So the African-American spending power, I, I believe they say there's more than pretty much 60% of worlds. I mean, not worlds, um, country, sorry. It's only one world. Yeah. Allahu alam, Allah's in order to worlds. Was. But you know what I mean, yeah, countries course. where... The African American spending power, if I'm not mistaken, I think they said it's four trillion dollars. That's phenomenal. But I believe they the fastest group in the USA with the money leaves their community. You know what I mean? So it's a lot of 
financial illiteracy going on in a black American community. So when you hear people, they say, even though you have some neighbors, some of the poorest people in America still Latin and African American people, but the the spending power is there. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just nothing that they don't really have the understanding of how to keep it in their community to to invest the money. Like there was one speaker, I think he mentioned something that the African Americans alone spend a couple billion dollars just on Jordans. He like, we have trillions, but we buy this amount of Jordans. I laughed. I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, Man, is this a joke? I had to laugh. You know what I mean? To yeah. look at my Jordans. I was like, wait a minute. Uh, well, I'm in Saudi, so mine's don't count. Yeah, yeah. I, don't think he, I don't think he counted my Jordans. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it shows a, 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 that there's a lot of illiteracy, financial illiteracy in our neighborhoods. Um, not only just the Muslim communities, but the black and brown communities yeah. as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think that it, it, it takes it takes... We need to learn not only how to make money, how to save money, how to invest money and spend money. This is very important because as an African-American Muslim, we always want good for our community. You know what I mean? The Prophet Islam went to his community first and called the people to Islam. You know what I mean? So we want to see the, our communities back home growing with Islam, financial literacy, literacy. We want to see these things. You know what I mean? And I think there's why the number really resonated and hit me was that fact that we can often feel unempowered but actually this is a lot of money yeah, and if it's yeah. being pushed and used in the right way actually True. it's a lot more a lot more just in terms of how it's uplifting communities yes yes rather yes. than us just being consumers True. we move into that space of producers mashallah like you know so. and that that economy is then linked True, you know, true, true, the money's true. benefiting the areas that it's earned in and it's spent in those areas mm. as opposed to leaving. See, that's that's the problem. It, it leaves, it's the quickest dollar to leave this community is African-American community. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and that's the problem. You know what I mean? They don't have no understanding of how we can keep it in the community. Then they get upset. Yeah. You know, I know my people, they get angry. Well, why the Arabs have the stores here, the Asians, the white? Because they invested in the community because they know you're going to spend in what they bring in. Yeah. You know what I mean? But we have the spending power to to build our neighborhoods up. And then you see the hikmah of the Sharia again. When you look at the examples of the Prophet when he spoke about looking after your neighbors. And when he was speaking about the rights of your neighbors, he was sitting down and then he got up. And the companions around him, they thought the Prophet was emphasizing it so much. We thought that they'd be included in our inheritance. Subhanallah. Right? So this wow. is like your neighbors, like the wow, rights of wow. your neighbors. Sa, sa. So even, you know, the attribution of this and that, if you give your children yeah. something to play with, mm. be mindful of not doing it in front of your neighbors so their children, if they can't afford it. Sa, sa, sa. My grandmother raised me that way. You, you know? know? My Christian grandmother, I remember whenever I run in the house and try to make a quick sandwich and I'd be about to run outside, she used to say, if you don't have enough to feed the whole everybody around you, don't eat in front of the people. Oh, and my grandmother used to, she, I was built that way, you know what I mean? So now I could be on the airplane, people think I'm a weirdo. Yeah. Like uh, somebody be sitting next to me, even Islamically, this is yeah. part of y'all culture. Yeah. The Africans, the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Arabs. Yeah. Y'all yeah, been doing this for a thousand years, but for African Americans, we had our chicken. <laughs> Man, we, we ain't getting none of this chicken. <laughs> yeah. so, but my grandmother raised me that we always share, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So I could be on a plane, I was raised that way. I don't even know a person, I'll be like, you want, you know? Yeah. But but because of the American culture, like, I don't want nothing in your sandwich. You trying to poison me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we already think you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just program like that. It is. I was raised like that. You know what I mean. And this money being back in the communities, also even from a zakat perspective, they say that you should give it in your community first. This wow, was originally how it was said was that. So yes. those need around you, so you don't have this thing in society where you're thinking. Why is so-and-so got this and why is so-and-so sa, doesn't? Sa, sa, sa. So Alhamdulillah, there's such a beauty to it and when it's, it's done properly. And Islam shows, brother, that the more you give, the more Allah gives back. Absolutely. And this is something that I remember one of the scholars mentioned that everybody can experience this. Everybody can sit back and say, there was a time I gave this amount of money in Sadaqa and then all of a sudden I didn't expect yeah. this this amount of money to come. Yes. Like we, all, we know that, you know what I mean? That the more you give back, the more Allah give to you. So... We will never go wrong helping absolutely. our communities, helping our families. You know what I mean? Just we don't like need that. Reba. No, absolutely. We don't yeah. need Reba to do this. <laughs> <laughs> as, uh, as we approach kind of the conclusion of the podcast, bro, it's just been phenomenal. I'd like to ask you the question. Yes. If you had the opportunity to do a podcast with three people from history, any three people, Mm. Who would you want to speak to? Who would, uh, like, would like as they would be my guests? They would yes. be your guests. Wow, I do have a podcast show, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah move to Q. I'm gonna shout Mashallah. this out. Now. Good, yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. We'll, we'll have... My host is a Korean American. Q, shout out to Q. And um, 
we pretty much, man, I don't, you know. But from, any, his, good from, history, from history. From history. Any history. three people that's run throughout history. Damn, I'm afraid to say Prophet Muhammad because then somebody might say, stuck for the law, we're killing you. Yeah. You know, how did you say this? You know, yeah. you know we got to be careful. Let's keep yeah. the religion out of it. People might, you know, Muslims, we take things the wrong way all yeah, the time. Yeah, exactly. no, but I mean, in, know, in the way that, inshallah, we'll all get to speak to it. To yeah, him. may Allah give us jinnah with him, inshallah. I mean, but, I mean, I mean. You know, for a podcast, anyone in history, man, it's deep, bro. Yeah. So I think. Who would that you from a personal connection? Could maybe someone in your family. I got. I'll, I'll pick someone that's yeah. alive because I don't want you know. Then yeah, I did something like that before in the internet. Oh, how are you trying to? I thought your religion told you when they dead, they dead. Like people. Right. <laughs> no, no, it's, so it's not let's bringing it back. Way. Yeah, I it's know, but people, people take stuff so out yeah, of control. Yeah, they do, they do. But it's like I mean? I'd love to talk to this person. I would I'd love, love to, to talk to that person. person. So, you know, like I you, think. Um, yeah. You know, honestly, I would love to now with my mindset, and um. I would have loved to be able to, if I had the opportunity, we know it can't happen. You know, he's passed away, but Pac. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, just think, honestly, you know just what I mean? I would, I would, because of the way he was thinking back then, if he was still alive, you know, he's not alive, guys. Because we, because yeah, people got a big disclaimer, I mean? no. <laughs> disclaimer, of course. But, so he ain't going to try if we go smoking beds. Like, he's, in he's in like, Cuba, they're yeah. in Puerto Rico. They already yeah. think yeah. he's in Puerto Rico or Cuba somewhere. Yeah. But I would love to, I would love to see his growth. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, now, because when he was twenty five years old, thinking of what he was thinking, you know, I would have. And he was gonna get. Into, he wanted to get into, you know, politics and different other things. I would have loved to see how he would have turned out if his life wouldn't have been taken away from him, you know, so short. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Not so short. Stack for a lot. Well, but yeah, yeah. Got to be careful what but you it's... say nowadays, because every it was written the way a lot. Yeah, written, yeah. But he was young. He was, you young, know, yeah. he was young, twenty five yeah. years old. Do you see? Do you think he was seen as just as a slight digression? Do you think he was seen as someone dangerous by the authorities? Of course, I think they got a whole FBI file on him. Where you know they really, really, um, even Pac said it one day. He 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 was surprised because he had this thing called fifty NIGGA, where he wanted to get fifty states, the gangsters from all these fifty states, and he wanted to bring them together. And he wanted to do a program where he was going to say, OK, from this time to this time, when the kids are going to school, don't sell drugs. When the kids are walking home from school, no shootouts. You know, he because he said, I know you can't just go to the middle of the hood and say, don't sell drugs or don't kill each other. But at least don't do it at a time when innocent people are walking down the street. He said, so I wanted the people to, we wanted to give these two. It was 10 rules. You can't shoot dry bars shooting anymore, even because he knew. You can't just tell them don't kill your enemy because people yeah, mindset. Yeah. But he said, how can we curtail the killing? How can we stop the drugs being sold? Don't sell drugs to women. Don't sell. Like he was trying to do all of these things. And he said that and when he put it out there, he was surprised when he was jail. He was getting hundreds of letters. He said it was so scary that I didn't know what to do because I didn't know my power. People would say, I'm from Chicago. I have 100 gang members under me. Just tell us what to do. We would do it. I'm from L.A. I have this. If you want us to stop selling drugs at this time, we would do it. He said he didn't even know what to do after that. You know what I mean? That's so, of funny. course, these letters are being Visionary. infiltrated, through the, it's being filtered through the system. The police is reading this. Yeah. And they know, like, you know, J. Edgar Hoover, he said, the, when they asked him, what is the greatest threat to America? He said, African-American unity. J. Wow. Edgar Hoover, the founder yeah, of the yeah. FBI, said FBI, that. Yeah. So when you got people like Pac, these letters, so I'm sure they like we, and he's 25 years old. They probably was like, man, he's more of a threat than we think, you know? Okay, so that's one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but two, if you can, if you can't, just think. yes. Is there anyone else you think today that you see that you want to speak to that you think maybe can kind of get onto that trajectory? Amongst the modern, or you'd want to just put your arm around and say, "Come, mm. man, let me speak to you privately." Yeah. Like, come here, bro. Let me give yeah. you some advice. I think, um, man, what can I say? It's a good question, bro. You really put him on the spot, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you can you just give me? Because it'd be a football player, a rapper. Come on, help me out. <laughs> give me some boxes. Yeah, like. yeah. <laughs> um, I can even. Okay, so today there's some rappers uh, that you probably still Muslim. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like DJ Khaled. Yeah. I think if I had the opportunity, um, you know, they was recently in Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah. I'm the type of person, when these people come to Saudi Arabia, I'm not talking about what they come for personally, their business. Yeah, yeah. But when they come to walk around the country, 
I'm happy to be able to run it to them because we take this as an opportunity to give them dawah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Show them another side of Islam. So, you know, we recently, I wish I would have had the opportunity to talk to Gigi Khaled. I, t- I spoke to him, I mean, you know, I talked to him quickly on the phone with Fat Joe called him for me. Fat Joe visited our restaurant and he called him. But I said to myself, because this is an individual who seemed like he loved Islam. Yeah. He just doesn't have the right people around him that's probably trying to advise him properly. So I, w- I, I, I wish that if I have an opportunity, because I come from their background, yeah. so I can't really, I might not be able to get to a boxer. He might not understand me, but as a rapper, I come from the, that world, so I can, I know what they're doing, I know where they're heading, and I know how to give them dawah, I believe. Yeah. And the reason why I say that, because I know when I first was Muslim, people gave me dawah, they might meant well, but they actually chased me away from the Muslims. Uh, and I believe that's happening with people like DJ Khaled, where practicing Muslims are only concentrating and focus on, well, he did this haram, and he did how is he in Mecca with this, how is he on that? Aki, where, what about giving these people dawah? Yeah. What about, like, the first 10 years or the first 13 years of Islam, Aisha said that the verses that was revealed in the Quran was only tawheed. It wasn't about what's haram and halal, she yeah, said, because rules, yeah. no one would accept the religion of Islam. Yes. We still have to, even though he might be born Muslim, but as Muslims, we still need to give this dawah to people like DJ Khaled and French Montana and, and these rappers. Because if you don't do it and if you chase them away and they're afraid to come around the Muslims, then who else are they going to hang around? Yeah, you know what I mean? Sure. So if I get the opportunity, I wish I get the opportunity to sit down with them you know what I mean? Inshallah. Inshallah. Maybe. The last one I've got an idea for. Inshallah. Right. Was there someone when you were coming up through the music scene that you would consider your enemy that now you'd wish, you know what? Let me just sit down and have a chat with this person. It's um, a good question. I did a lot of crazy things to people. You yeah. know what I mean? Like literally, like I did a lot of um, I fought a lot of people did some violent things you know what I mean <laughs> you know, we've got, we've got some of them deserved it some of them deserved it though but <laughs> yeah. I think um, who can I say because I want the opportunity to yeah. go back and be able to tell people like you know you gotta understand my mindset back then I was ignorant Yeah, I was a young kid I was ignorant um I don't care about Puffy too much. May Allah guide him. If he become Muslim, yeah. he'll be my friend. Yeah. <laughs> May Allah guide him. I can't really talk about yeah. it. May Allah help me because I, I, I got to get this. <laughs> we'll get it bro. Don't worry. Get Allah. But I think, um, you know, Loon. Yeah. You know, I was able to, we friends. He from yeah. Bad Boy. I'm from Death Row. You know what I mean? Before Islam, you know, it, it was an opportunity before Islam that I caught him. And I, 30 or 40 of my friends just went around the corner. And to tell you the story is that when I walked out of the club, I seen him and he's like, what's up? And I said, like, you that bad boy dude. Because we hated bad boy. Bad boy was the label Puff Daddy and stuff like from that. Coast Coast, right? Yeah, they was from East Coast. <laughs> we was from, you know, representing the West Coast. Yeah. And when I seen him, I was like, wow, we got 30 of the homies here. Yeah. We can come back and get them. You know what I mean? And then something just told me to shake his hand. I was like, okay. Shook his hand and it kept it moving. Years later, alhamdulillah, I became Muslim. About two, three years after I became Muslim, I get a phone call. Somebody's like, somebody want to talk to you. And it was Loon. He just took Shahada. And I said to myself, that's the reason probably why nothing ever happened. Because, of course, if you if you do something bad to a person, they become Muslim, they might still have it in their heart. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that was one person that I was able, I'm happy nothing bad happened to. And, 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 and I will put a general message out there. Like anybody that I did something wrong to, disrespected, beat up or whatever, you know, <laughs> did crazy things. They had to realize that I was ignorant. I was ignorant and jahil, you know. Islam is what put me on that right path, you know what I mean? So anybody that I did, you know, something wrong to and who didn't deserve it, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last couple of questions. Um, it's been so good, alhamdulillah. Just chatting. We could chat for many more hours, of yeah, course. this is probably the longest <laughs> time I've yeah. feel natural, though. Yeah, no, alhamdulillah. Yeah, it's, it's so it's good. Uh, but... Um, or well, a few last questions. Um, you 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 mentioned the dua you first made when you um, did such a. Yes. What do you make dua for now? Now I make so much dua, bro. You know what I mean. I think you asked this question to Khabib or something like that, huh? Yeah, yeah. See, yeah. It's my, special question, yeah all you, my special question, man. My special question. You know, I, I I always make dua. I can say, of course, for my family, for he died for myself. You know what I mean? I, I always ask a lot to not let me go back to my old ways, mm, to not I mean, misguide me after guiding me. 
you know what I mean, to um, protect my family, to let me die on Islam. You know what I mean? That's a dua. I always say, Allah, Jimmy let me I die mean. on Islam. You know what I mean? And let my last deeds be my best deeds. It's very important. You know what I mean? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, he asked for guidance. So I think it's important that we always got to remember that, that, you know what I mean? Because we just want to die on Islam. We want, we want Allah to accept our deeds. You know what I mean? I mean we don't know if our deeds accept it. We won't know until Yom Kiyama. Yes. So when you live, it, you, we have to humble ourselves. You know what I mean? We have to humble ourselves because we don't know what's going to happen to us. And we just pray that Allah, but we do know Allah's Gafur Rahim. We do know he's more merciful than us than our own mothers are. Yes. So that hadith has always given me hope. You know what I mean? That if you think about, you know what I mean? Like my mother took 13 bullets protecting me and my kids. Allah's more merciful than us than my own mother. So when you think of that, you you have hope, alhamdulillah. So the believer live between hope and fear. Alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. And, um, We've got a little quick fire round, but before we do that, yes, we've mentioned a few hadiths throughout this podcast. Is there a specific one that really resonates with you? Hmm. Good question, bro. Y'all got the hardest <laughs> questions. <laughs> we left them to the end. <laughs> Is it a specific hadith? Um, or it could be an ayah. Whatever. Ayah. Yeah, my favorite ayah, even though when we say this, we want to be clear, the whole Quran is our favorite. You know, we love yeah, the Quran, yeah. but one of the ayahs that really touched me is when Allah said, we found you, have we not found your orphan and sheltered you? Have we not found you lost and guided you? It's even though that was for yeah. the Prophet Islam, but it always hit home with me, you know what yeah. I mean? Because I was in that position. You know, it's alhamdulillah. It's beautiful. It's a, Surah Duha. <laughs> it's beautiful because it's, especially know. those people who are going through difficulty. It no. talks about the darkest, you know, after the darkness of the night, it's the the sunrise, and after mm. darkness, there's always the light. You know, that after hardship, there's going to be ease. Yes. 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 And, and then Usra Yusra. Sa, sa. And this was it. Did we not find you misguided? And that's one of my favorites too. That like you just yeah. mentioned, that yeah. after every hardship, there's ease. Like because when you hear these verses, because we all human. We all sin. We all make mistakes. We all gonna go through difficulties. We all gonna go through trials. This is this is life. But when these verses, it just give you hope. Inna al inna al usra yusra. Yeah. Inna ma al Inna ma al usri yusra. Inna ma al usri yusra. Every hardship, disease. So when you Allah hear that, Allah repeats it. Allah repeats it. Subhanallah. Inna ma al usri yusra. So you gotta so after that, you gotta say, "Well, I'm stressing." Yeah, yeah. Like if you read verses like that, it should help us say Allah, was Allah promises, us, like you said, two times. Yeah. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. That's a really good note. Now I'm just gonna do a really quick fire out. You might have seen this before as well. No thinking. But I don't know if you've whatever. Prepped it, but I'm gonna give you two options and you have to yeah. just say what comes to your mind first, right? But the first one I already know because I see you using an iPhone, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's better Android iPhone, I think he knows you. <laughs> Keep making right. the awful guy. But there's there's a few different ones. There are a few different ones here, yeah. This is my, my Samsung man here, Android man. <laughs> so all right, I'm gonna start off. So just again, just clear your mind and then just whatever comes to you first, right? All right. Android or Apple. Apple. Yeah. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Easy one. Beef or chicken? Chicken, actually. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Burger or Kubsa? Kubsa. Yeah? Yes. No, you're proper Saudi now. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, we, we, we Americans, we grew up on burgers, man. Yeah. Like, I like different stuff. All right. Riyadh or New Jersey? Riyadh, bro. Yeah? Hands down. <laughs> Leicester or South London? <laughs> South London. Oh, come on. Because I, <laughs> I think I've only been to Leicester <laughs> once. You need to come down, bro. I'll Forget it, bro. You got, you got, I've been only once. So bro, London, yeah, I've been multiple yeah, times. Yeah, uh. you got a brother. Forget I'll come visit, inshallah. Inshallah, you got to come down. Pele or Maradona? Huh? Pele or Maradona? To be honest, it's probably going to probably be... I, I don't... I never really seen any of them play that much. Yeah. I know Pele recently passed away. They're both legends, right? Yeah, that's right. But I can't really pick any of them because I don't really know. I'm Kareem Benzema all the way, bro. The yeah. first time I ever yeah. went to a football game was because Benzema, shout out, he invited me. Oh, really? And that's and, and now I'm I'm a Real Madrid. Yeah, and, that's... you know I'm a Real Madrid fan, bro. Yes. Because Kareem, of that. we want you on the podcast. Next, inshallah, <laughs> come through. Inshallah. Come yeah. through with him. Inshallah. <laughs> all right, this one's been an interesting one because of recent events. Ronaldo, or Messi. Hmm. Damn, that's because I I actually seen them play a little bit. Yeah. But I, I think because um. I would say Messi. Really? Even though people okay. are starting to be like, oh, we got Ronaldo. But because I really, I don't think I've ever seen Ronaldo play a game. 
Okay. I told you, like, I'm really so new with yeah. football that okay. I, I just started calling it football. Yeah, yeah. It was soccer. It was soccer. <laughs> soccer before. So I just started, because Americans, we don't really watch football. You know what I mean? Yeah. We think that basketball is the biggest sport until you yeah, leave yeah, yeah. the country. So because I seen um, Messi play, I would say Messi. But you, inshallah, will get to see inshallah, Ronaldo see play Ronaldo. a lot more so now. seeing Riyadh now. Yeah, you know what I mean? now, now he's now he's a neighbor. Yeah, inshallah. now I gotta go. I gotta check him out real time. Exactly, I gotta Mitch check him is out. doing all right in that. If you want some like beef in that, some yeah, ribs, you want some you know? beef and you're doing help him play strong. Come through, Smoky Beard. You want to start some beef? Not that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this this one. I mean, I know you watch boxing. Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali? Wow, that's a good one. But Muhammad Ali, because even Mike Tyson would say, man, why you pick me? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> he'll, he'll yeah, Mike there. Tyson would be mad at Muhammad Ali because he was more than a boxer. You know what I mean? He 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 stood up for something. So he's a legend, Allah Yeah, you know, you know when you say uh if you could uh in podcast interview three people from the past, like he's somebody that I would have loved to have yeah, spoken yeah, to. Yeah, Muhammad Ali. Man. Man. He what was a character. special, bro. He, he, he definitely was special. He was doing he was special in standing up for things when it wasn't popular to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Nowadays it's popular. People stand up for just likes. You mm. know what I mean? But he was doing it when he sacrificed. He sacrificed. Well. Yeah, for sure. He gave up that belt. You wow. know, and we're talking about people, they don't want to give up a little bit of income or they don't want to do this or yeah, their values yeah. when they go abroad. Oh no. Yeah. If they yeah. really were sincere by their principles, they would stand to it. They would stand by it. And he stood by him, bro. And he became Muhammad Ali when yeah. that wasn't popular. Yeah. You know, exactly. nowadays being a Muslim in America, he probably made it easy now to be able to have a name he, he like did. Muhammad. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, in America. Wow, amazing. Alhamdulillah. Sure, Uta, bro, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. Allah, so we could we could carry on talking for, for <laughs> and we will, inshallah. <laughs> we will one, 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 <laughs> but uh, Jazakallah khair no, for. Jazakallah khair. And what y'all doing is amazing. Keep it up. We need this in our community, you know what I mean? So I, I advise everybody to check you guys out. Money guys? Yeah, Muslim money guys, Muslim yeah. money guys, man. Where the money at, though? <laughs> <laughs> so, under, uh, the the briefcase. So, Allah. You know, uh, I, thank you, brothers. Allah, Allah really bless you. Uh, Allah Ameen. Azawajal protect you. Ameen, Allah keep Ameen. your iman intact. Allah Ameen. reward you for the sacrifice that you made in this world and the next. Uh, and alhamdulillah, Ameen. you've chosen for your family to be raised in that environment. Allah Ameen. make them a means of honor for you in this world and the next Ameen. as well. Ameen. All of our kids. Ameen. 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 Thank you, brothers. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Allah bless you, man. That was a good podcast even for me.